Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the French German Machine Learning Symposium. This is day two. And it's my great pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Nicolas Mansart, Research Director uh, at CNRS in Toulouse. And Nicolas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daniel. Sharing the screen and starting the presentation. Okay, good morning, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. Guten Morgen. Um, so for starting this, uh, this second day, I propose to guide you in the mathematical foundation of uh, motion generation in robotics. And um, particularly, I would like to convince you of uh, an intermediate road between the classical um, robotics approaches and the mainstream uh, reinforcement learning. So uh, as a basis, um, I think we can say there is a kind of consensus for using optimal control formulation to represent motion generation problems. So an optimal control problem would be to uh, describe that the robot should behave by optimizing uh, an objective function, either maximizing a reward or minimizing a cost, given um, its motion capability generally expressed by a differential equation, something like uh, x dot is equal to f of x, u and, uh, of x and u, where x is a state and u is a control and a various bunch of, uh, of constraints. So we can come back to this, uh, to this formulation, but maybe first let's look at what are the solution, uh, what, what is the, the geometry of the object that we are searching. So the solution of an optimal control problem would be a complex object that generally we can see as two-sided. Either you can see that as a trajectory. So a trajectory mathematically would be a function from time to the control space. And generally, if you look at the solution this way, it means that you are in motion planning. Or you can consider that the solution is a, uh, an optimal policy. Uh, so it's a function from the state space X to the control space U. And if you are searching the solution this way, generally it means that you are in reinforcement learning. And clearly, mathematically, if you have one solution, so an optimal trajectory, for example, you can get the other one, for example, the policy and uh, reciprocally. So I would like to take advantage of this uh, observation that the two communities are working with two different objects that are the solution to the same problem to try to see if we can go a little bit beyond what uh, uh, current algorithm are able to. And mostly I would like to uh, give a, a parkour on the, on the three uh, main uh, bullet points. First, uh, really explore what is the formulation of the problem that we want to solve? What are the properties at which level we want to, uh, to, uh, to sit? Then I would like to give a, a look at the solvers. What are uh, the, the properties that we can expect from the solvers trying to solve this, uh, this uh, optimal problem? And uh, I would like also to discuss the connection with the hardware because that's what is really key in robotics. So let's start with the formulation. Um, so maybe give first a, a quick look at how current state of the art control approaches are, are set up. Um, a, a robot control architecture, currently it's a multi-layer uh, architecture with very different um, uh, frequencies, starting from the power loop that is uh, running directly on the, on the motor at a very high frequency, like 50 kilohertz. Then um, uh, a loop controlling either the joint position velocity state or the joint torques running on each motor boards at quite high frequency as well, and that's joint by joint. Then uh, the first user level, where still at high frequency on good robots, you would decide what is the reference uh, state of the robot or the reference torque of the robot to be applied by the motor board. Uh, classical formulations here are inverse schematics or inverse dynamics. And then typically a, a, a um, task space, a, a task level, where at a lower frequency and using XRO sensor, you can close the loop and achieve uh, uh, more advanced behaviors. So when you are considering this architecture, you can put a, um, a learning um, solution at any level you want. So typically you would put that at the task level. So that's for example what we did, but there is many examples in the literature. We are not at all the first to do that. You can do that by the, to, to learn where the robot should uh, navigate so that the um, uh, lower level uh, part of the architecture would be easy to uh, to produce locomotion. Okay. So that's typically what you would expect from the task level, having an abstract behavior that the lower level would be able to accomplish. 
But um, I would consider here, I would like to convince you that uh, it is worthwhile to, uh, to look at the global architecture. Um, first, because mathematically, that's what we want to do. Uh, even if you define a policy at the task space level, what you finally uh, obtain implicitly is a policy at the lowest level. Uh, also, because if you want to, want to, 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 uh, to uh, optimize any policy, you need to simulate all these behaviors, so you need to understand that uh, properly. And finally, um, if you want to get any guarantee, the, the maximum guarantee that you can get on the upper level is the one that is offered by the lower level. So if you want to have a safe control, if we want to have a safe control on the robot, I think we really need to work at the global, uh, at the global level. Um, so let's go for the global level. And uh, uh, even if you are not convinced that our algorithm su should solve the problem at the global level, you, you, have, uh, you have to be convinced that you have to simulate the behavior at the global level. So to simulate and to uh, formulate the optimal control problem, um, we need first to describe what is the, the law of physics on the robot. And the law of physics are well understood. Uh, the, the robot uh, moves with its acceleration, so the derivative of its velocity times its mass, plus some centrifugal and gravity terms, equal to the torque supplied by the motors and the forces applied by the environment in reaction to the, to the torque of the motor. That would be a linear equation where the, the main um, component is the mass matrix here which has uh, quite a sparse structure, all the white here is, is zeros, but it's not so sparse. Uh, so if you, have, if you treat that as a sparse matrix, uh, you won't be efficient. More, more, more than sparse, it is structure. There is a very strong structure in this matrix. Now, if your robot is, for example, in contact with the environment, you would have also a part of the, of the law uh, that is describing how the, the contact behaves. And that would add some uh, rows and columns to the matrix and still uh, uh, present a lot of structure. So in robotics, we are very uh, advanced in terms of understanding these structures and providing algorithms or algebra that is very efficiently handling this, uh, this structure. So not saying that the, the parameters that we identified or the exact law of physics that we are, we are putting, they are always uh, matching the, the reality, but the algebra that we have is, is super efficient. So for example, to handle all the dynamics of the robot, you only need five microseconds of, of uh, computation. Microsecond is really a unit that we are not using very often. So I tried to do a matching comparison and that would correspond to four, uh, a, a network with four hidden layers of uh, size 64. So that's quite a reasonable uh, network, a very small one, not a network that would be sufficient to just under this, uh, this dynamics. So we put that uh, in, in a package that is uh, arguably uh, the best sof software package that is open source uh, for describing the mechanics of robot called Pinocchio with uh, um, Brian's supervision of our uh, leadership of Justin Carpentier from, uh, from Willow Paris. And I think we are at a point where this software could be a standard of our community. So now we have the, the mechanics described, we can go to the optimal control problem. So again, the optimal control problem would be to optimize X and U trajectories. Um, that is uh, minimizing a cost function, for example, uh, given a bunch of constraints. And here the constraints are playing a very important role. And there is a, a lot of different constraints. So for example, constraint to impose state feedback, uh, constraint to impose that the, uh, the obtained trajectory or the obtained behavior match the, um, the, the simulation, uh, and additional constraints of, of very different kinds, like we could have a box constraints, uh, cone constraints, equality constraints, uh, long-term viability constraints. We can even have frequency constraints. So uh, there is a lot of constraints on, on robots, and we have to render that at the, at the decision level. Um, and too often, these constraints, they are hidden in the simulator, uh, meaning that when you, when you send a, a behavior that is not matching the constraint, the simulator is clamping your, your behavior, which corresponds when you optimize uh, the, the optimal control problem. It, it would correspond to a projected descent, which is not, not a very efficient uh, numerical algorithm. Um, and here, in, in this uh, optimization problem, we have all the derivatives we want because uh, all the, the dynamics have been formulated our way. And with these dynamics, we can have all the derivatives. Since we have all the derivatives, we should expect from our solver superlinear convergence. That's, that's really something we should, we, we, should, uh, we should expect. And if, if we are not doing the stuff uh, cleanly, then we are not getting this uh, this. Um, something that is important to understand is uh, if my, um, yeah, uh, want to show my, my video, is that um, 
by modeling the physics this way, we have straightforward generalization. So here you have a, a robot that is doing a kind of a pick and place task going from one point to the other. And in, uh, in, uh, at simulation time, it has been um, producing a movement uh, forward. But when it is this term, it would discover by straightforward on, on, the, on the flight, uh, another behavior backward, right? And, and that's just a generalization of, of physics because we have a strong model. So I think here, uh, it, it's very important that we accept to, to manipulate this model the, the clean way. Okay, so th that was for the formulation. Let's go now uh, in, uh, in the solvers. So the first, first part, and that's the state of the art, let, let's say, um, we want to solve, um, to, to obtain the optimal trajectories. So optimal trajectories are something that you need to replan um, uh, online at runtime. So for each, each new state of the robot, you have to solve an optimal control problem. And that's fine because this optimal control problem is not so big. So the state of the art and what is well, well understood is that this, uh, the, the numerical solvers that we are applying to uh, trajectory uh, uh, optimization problems, they should cope with uh, instability due to the, the dynamics, to the, to, the, to the instability of the prediction of an unstable control system. So that's the first point. And basically the key word for, for tackling the instability is multiple shooting. And uh, second point, we need to understand the sparsity and the structure because as, you, as you've seen, uh, there is a, a very strong structure, both in the, in the mechanics and uh, in the control, uh, in the control um, uh, problem uh, itself. And we have proposed uh, uh, an algorithm called FDDP, which combines both, so which is uh, um, optimally sparse and multiple shooting algorithm. And that's uh, in, in uh, another uh, open source package co called Crocodile. And just to give you an idea of the, the efficiency we can get, if you want to optimize four trot cycles of a quadruped, that would correspond to roughly 5,000 variables. You would need 12 iterations to converge to uh, an optimal solution. And for each step of the, of the descent, you would need four, micro, four milliseconds. For a humanoid, a two-step of a humanoid, you would get 8,000 variables, 18 iterations, and nine, nine milliseconds per steps. Okay? So that's fast enough to be evaluated at runtime. Uh, and that's something so we, we can have the policy opt, um, obtained this way, implicitly obtained this way at runtime. Now, the, the main issue when we are doing the, the stuff this way is um, the, the non-convexity of the optimal uh, control formulation. So uh, for, for me, it's clear that we, we won't obtain a convex formulation of the optimal control problem. And then we need to accept that we would get only local solution. And the good way to, to, uh, to cope with that is to provide an initial guess, so a good warm start that is clone, close enough for the, to, to the global solution so that we can get this super li uh, linear convergence to the global optimum. So what, what we are doing is simply that offline, we are generating a lot of samples of how the robot should behave depending on initial condition and environment conditions. We are optimizing these samples and we are putting that in, the, in a memory of motion, which is a, just an encoded uh, database. Um, and then at runtime, we are ping, picking, uh, extrapolating uh, uh, a candidate solution from this, uh, this uh, memory of motion and uh, optimizing from, from that point. Uh, here is uh, uh, some snapshots of the, uh, the database that we have generated in the context of locomotion in the European project Memory of Motion, MEMO, uh, that I um, coordinate. And uh, here is an example uh, on the real robot. So here we have a, a runtime optimization of the full body of the robot, tracking a virtual target while avoiding obstacles. And we are using both the capability of the online solver and the memory of motion to, uh, to provide a new, a new initial guess, especially close to the obstacle. That's very important. That's where the, the optimal control solver will waste a lot of, of time to discover a good solution. And uh, so finally, we want to extend this idea by closing the loop and really computing the optimal policy. So for that, what we are doing is that we are sampling a lot of uh, uh, locally optimal uh, uh, solution. So we are sampling, let's say, 30 states in the state, state space and trying to connect all these states together. So that would give us something like 1,000 um, optimal trajectories. But since we are using a, no, a locally optimal control solver, we only get maybe 20% of them. Uh, the, the, the rest of the calls to the solver, they are, they are failures. And on the 20% uh, of, um, of uh, solution that we get, 
I would say that something like 20% are optimal. So we have only a, a few numbers of optimal solution. We are sampling then, so we are taking sub to, uh, to produce a, a, a large data set of something like 10,000 uh, uh, locally optimal trajectories that we are just learning uh, by uh, classical regression. Now we can query and get an initial guess of what would be, uh, by extrapolation, uh, uh, possible optimal trajectories to connect two states. And we are just closing the loop. So we, we are now generating new optimal trajectories from this initial guess. And at every iteration of this loop, we would only be able to get better trajectories. So we are, we are converging down to, the, to, a, to a minimum. And we are lower bounded by the hamilton jacobi bellman solution, which is uh, um, guaranteeing us a, a lower bound. So we call this loop uh, iterative roadmap extension and policy approximation, which is um, uh, a way of completing a policy using uh, optimization and uh, supervised learning. And using this uh, formulation, we can use the derivative at, at all the stages of this, uh, this algorithm. And uh, we hope to, to, uh, to obtain superlinear convergence that we obtain uh, empirically and that we are trying now to demonstrate uh, theoretically. Uh, let me very quickly finish on applying that to the robot. So there is a, a first thread of trying to apply that to uh, flagship uh, experimental platforms like the human and robot Talos. Uh, we, we just now received the funding for uh, going to the next generation of Talos, uh, a French grant uh, Equipex. Uh, that's very difficult for uh, um, every single lab to get such a huge platform. That's why uh, I think the, the way to work here is by, by working in consortium. And uh, the, our, our lab is, uh, is hosting experimental platform. So if, if you need access to such kind of platform, uh, that I think is a solution. An alternative solution is to go with smaller robots, like this uh, open dynamic robot initiative led by Max Planck in collaboration with us and with uh, New York University, where you have a, a chip, well, uh, not so cheap, but uh, something like uh, below 10,000 uh, 10, euros. Um, very efficient. Uh, you have a solo, uh, quadruped version, a biped version. Um, since it's completely open source, it reduces the nonlinear hidden effects. And it's hard to break, easy to fix, so that's uh, very good for machine learning. Um, as a conclusion, uh, three main messages. Uh, for me, physics is easy to model. Uh, we don't need to learn it. Uh, especially, we don't need to learn the algebra to manipulate uh, physics. Uh, so maybe we need to provide uh, uh, strong um, physics layers in a, in, a, in a neural network, the same way we, we, uh, you provided a strong uh, convolution la uh, layers to handle uh, images. So that would be an equivalent for manipulating uh, uh, mechanical systems. Um, when simulating an, uh, any reinforcement learning, learning algorithm now is working simulation, we get the directive nearly for free. So it would be good to use that to get better convergence properties. And final message, robotic labs are expensive. Let's work in consortium. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, happy to take questions if there is any and if we have time. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, do we have questions? I think we do have time for one short question. Um, uh, I don't see any. I'll, I'll ask a question myself. I think your work, Nicola, actually addresses a very central problem in robotics that has always often bothered me when, when you see a robot, say, grasp a, a cup or something like that. I've seen many demos and, you know, it, it virtually takes forever for the robot to grasp the cup. And when I asked my colleagues in robotics why that took so long, they said that the traditional approaches tend to search the entire search space and, and, and try to find the optimal uh, uh, policy, the optimal trajectory. And that if you, if you do a complete search over all possible trajectories, obviously that's going to take forever. And I think now what you're promoting is approaches that are significantly faster because they don't do the complete search and they, they go more efficiently. But I think you highlighted one challenge and that is that you tend to go into local minima. Um, you also proposed this probabilistic sampling based approach to get better solutions. And you mentioned that you have 20% uh, optimal solutions in your experiments. But somehow I guess this 
this degree of non-convexity that you have here, or say the number of local minima, that must depend on the type of problem you're solving, right, with the robot. Can you elaborate a little bit what makes the problem non-convex or what, what, what do these local minima correspond to and, and in which situations do you encounter more or less local minima? So non-convexity is very easy to establish. We have an equality constraints, which correspond to the, to the simulation, right? So the simulation is non-linear. So we have a non-linear equality constraints. A end of the story, it's non-convex, right? That's, that's very easy. And well, for, for a robot arm, you have a lot of angles, so then you would have cosine and sines. So again, non-convexity, that's, that's easy. Um, now, what is the level of non-convexity? And that's, that's really difficult to characterize. Um, so basically, we know we are not non-convex, but uh, we are always starting with reasonable solution. Um, maybe a very simple reasonable solution is a free fall. And even free fall is likely to be in a, a lot of, in, in, the, in the convergence basin of many optimal control problems. So it's very difficult to characterize. For, for biped locomotion, for example, we observe a superlinear convergence from the very first iteration, starting from free fall. So it seems that's a, a basic locomotion problem that that seems to be a complex problem uh, is still not so non-convex, which, which is surprising. I, I was well, when we set up our, our solver, well, I was not expecting to get that. And now we have a lot of obstacles, uh, or no, not obstacles, constraints. We have a lot of constraints, and um, that, that's making the search much more difficult. Um, so yeah, difficult question, difficult to answer, um, but we have to understand that first, uh, whether you are optimizing the policy or optimizing the, the trajectories, you get the same issue of non-convexity and uh, that very likely sampling, uh, so random exploration, this kind of stuff, are going to cope with that because we would have a lot of solutions answering to problems and by extrapolating, you would get a very good solution for new problems. So maybe not such a big issue. Okay, thank you very much. In the interest of time, I'd like to thank you for the great presentation and the, the uh, question answer. Uh, and uh, we'll move on to our next speaker and that is Michael Muller from uh, the University of Siegen. Michael, Perfect. the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Um, Thanks for the invitation to speak here to you about deep learning and energy minimization methods for inverse problems. So the setting I'm considering is that I would like to recover some desired unknown quantity U from observed data F, uh, whose relation is determined by some kind of problem operator A and some measurement noise N. So maybe in the simplest case, think of just um, being given a blurry image and a blur kernel to then remove the blur and recover the, the nice, clean and sharp image. And for several decades, the type of approach to solve these problems have been energy minimization methods, where you determine your solution you had as an argument that minimizes a suitable cost function um, given by a data fidelity term that measures how well your current solution U explains your measured data F and a regularizer that tries to measure how realistic U is as an image. Now, over the last 10 years, the research in this field has changed, basically um, turning away from these approaches and turning towards deep learning where you just choose some parametric function called the network and try to accomplish the mapping from your data to your desired ground truth in a forward fashion, depending on parameters that you learn through your usual, uh, ideally fully supervised setting. Now, while deep learning is really dominating almost any benchmark in uh, image reconstruction these days, I think a few drawbacks of machine learning or deep learning remain that are not so much present in energy minimization methods. The first one being interpretability. So this is an example of a very low dose MRI uh, reconstruction where, okay, a classical approach just doesn't give very good results because the problem is so underdetermined. A network-based solution may look really nice at first glance, but looking in detail, there are some problems. Like for instance, an artificial blob I inserted into the ground truth 
that was never part of the training data, which is why the network uh, has a strong tendency to entirely neglect it. But even beyond these tricks to fool the network, there are, for instance, some fine thin structures and a network based solution did recover fine structures, but they move into a completely different direction, possibly leaving us with a different pathological interpretation of the images. The second challenge closely related is robustness. This is something that is well known for classification networks under the name of adversarial attacks. And it seems that for inverse reconstruction problems, uh, similar effects tend to happen. So this is an example of a very low dose uh, computerized tomography reconstruction where a standard network on standard data shows really nice reconstruction for the limited amount of data that was uh, provided to it. But changing the input data by only about 3%, we get a very bad reconstruction with even some structures that might be pathologically concerning. The third possible drawback is a limited versatility of such networks. Namely, they don't necessarily generalize well to tasks, tasks beyond what they have been trained on. So this is an example of denoising an image with a network that has been trained on removing Gaussian noise. And we see it pretty much perfectly preserves the noise and um, damps some of the structure of the fur of the giraffe here. So this is kind of a, a worst possible outcome and a, an adaption that is very easy to make in the world of energy minimization methods where you know if you're transitioning from something like Gaussian noise to something more impulsive like salt and pepper noise, you just switch your data fidelity term from something like L2 squared to L1 to be more robust. Now, my group has been working on addressing some of these uh, drawbacks by combining energy minimization and deep learning methods, uh, two examples of which I would like to show you now. So for instance, to address this last issue of versatility, one could consider writing down your favorite algorithm to compute minimizers of, let's say first, a completely model-based energy like this. So for instance, writing down something called proximal gradient descent would look like this, where you take a gradient descent step on the data fidelity term. This is this inner part here and then do a proximal step on the regularizer, meaning you're minimizing an L2 squared data fidelity term plus regularizer. And this from a perspective of maximum a posteriori probability estimates corresponds to a problem of removing Gaussian noise and gives rise to the idea of just replacing this step here uh, to become more regular by your favorite denoising algorithm. So for model-based denoising algorithms, this has been proposed under the name of plug and play priors. And we specifically considered ways of learning this denoising mapping. And the, the nice effect here is that we really do gain versatility on the aforementioned problems. So this is again, the result plainly applying a Gaussian denoising network on the image gave us. But if we use an algorithmic scheme like this and an L1 data fidelity term, we are in fact able to completely remove the noise here in a realistic fashion with the very same network that has only been trained on um, removing Gaussian noise. However, this is possibly not yet the end of uh, the story and solves all problems. So for instance, in a follow-up work, we considered what happened uh, if we have a zero data fidelity term and we just keep denoising the image, are common networks stable? And unfortunately, the answer is not necessarily. So this is what you get after 800 iterations of standard MATLAB's pre-trained DNCNN. And we can see that instead of converging to something smooth, which you would expect when you just continue denoising over and over again, um, it actually diverges to very large well values and weird structures. To gain more control over networks, specifically in iterative settings like this, we considered 
controlling neural networks by forcing them to actually monotonically decrease a model-based energy. So this is mostly addressing robustness. So if you have some model-based energy E, we consider training a network that takes a current estimate UK, the data F, the gradient at our current point, and depends of course still on learnable parameters theta, in such a way that it tries to predict an update to the current estimate UK. And we do so in a very specific way, namely by ensuring the network proposes a descent direction with respect to the model-based energy. So we would ensure that the network's output actually has an inner product with a negative gradient of the energy, which is, well, think of the right-hand side as zero, so which would be pointing in a similar direction and to then theoretically guarantee convergence, we need a little more than zero here on the right-hand side. So with this technique and a suitable step size rule, a gradient descent like iteration, but with a learned update direction coming from the network actually provably converges to minimizes of the original model-based energy. Now you may wonder why would I set up a complicated scheme to then converge to minimizes of a purely model-based energy? Couldn't I just do gradient descent? And I would like to give you two answers why this could still be of interest. The first one is if minimizes of E are not unique, you might select your minimizer in a data-driven fashion. So this is a toy example where we are just looking for two variables that sum up to five. And running gradient descent from any starting point will just take you to your solution space uh, in an orthogonal way indicated here by the flow field. Whereas given training data that might favor one component being zero and the other one being five um, or being equal to the value that, that you want to achieve here, you can learn a flow field that actually from any starting point converges to something that lies right in the middle of your training examples. Even if the uh, minimizer of your energy E is unique, it might be of interest to generate a better path, for instance, using something that is called discrepancy principle in inverse problems or early stopping in the context of networks, where you don't fully converge to a minimizer, but stop early depending on the noise you're expecting. And then of course, taking a trajectory that takes you closer to the ground truth, although it ultimately converges to the minimizer and stopping early may still give you much better results. Now, these ideas address some of the issues I mentioned in the beginning, but maybe not yet all of them at once. So a natural question for going forward would be, can we resolve all the three drawbacks of interpretability, robustness, and versatility at once. And having told you that energy minimization methods don't really suffer from these drawbacks, a natural question is, can we learn the energy to minimize and would that resolve all our problems? So learning the energy to minimize would then be something like this, where you have an energy E that is still parameterized by some parameters theta and you compute the argument that minimizes this energy that I'm calling UI of theta here. And then for training, you are comparing the argument that minimizes the energy with your desired ground truth on your training examples and find the best parameters here. Now, this is a technique which in applied mathematics is known under the name of bi-level optimization. And you may wonder now, does this already solve all our problems? But unfortunately here, the answer is clearly no, because really learning an energy like this without saying something about E has absolutely no advantage over plain supervised deep learning because it is in fact equivalent to deep learning. By picking the energy, your parameterized energy here as something like just the norm of um, U minus some parametric function applied to your data F, you can easily see that the argument that minimizes this energy here is just g of f and theta, which you then plug in here for ui and theta, and you are back at plain supervised deep learning. 
So it must be the mathematical structure of the energy that makes a difference here. Now, what would be a good structure? Well, having told you that typical model-based energies are comprised of a data fidelity term and a regularizer with our desire to be versatile with respect to the data fidelity term, it is natural to try to learn the regularizer only. So inserting now, um, maybe into the bilevel formulation I just showed you, just the idea of computing the argument that minimizes the regularizer and then comparing this argument that minimizes the regularizer to many different training examples. Well, first of all, this is not supervised deep learning anymore because your regularizer never sees data. But then you may also wonder how can I compare the argument here to multiple training examples? And the answer is, of course, now your regularizer should be, sorry, the, the set of minimizers should be really set valued. So many different views should be minimizers of R here. So this loss here compares now the distance of a set of minimizers U of theta to specific elements U I star. Now, if you want to pursue this kind of direction with this kind of structure, I think we are very close to the challenges that uh, we heard about in yesterday afternoon's talk by Jan Le Kuhn, at least in terms of the first two challenges that I will point out now. Namely, the first challenge would be to avoid the collapse to the set of minimizers being everything. Because of course, if your regularizer here is entirely flat, then the argument that minimize a flat regularizer could be the entire space. And then I'm comparing the distance of the entire space to specific elements. This would give me a zero loss here. So it would be a perfect solution. So we need some kind of technique to tell the regularizer to go up once we move away from training examples. However, we also want our regularizer to not go up too fast because otherwise we run into a different collapse, namely one where this argmin set are the training examples only, or from a probability point of view, we are converging to just the sum of delta peaks at the training examples. So this does not generalize well and is overfitted to the training data. So we want it to increase, but not increase too fast are the first two challenges. The third challenge is basically to do the numerics or optimization or mathematics. So we need to compute an argmin through a second argmin operation. And the fourth challenge that I would like to end with is what a good structure of the regularizer itself is. Um, because, of course, we are not in the setting of plain learning anymore, but for mathematical analysis like robustness, we would ideally like our regularizer to be convex. But from a practical perspective, convexity doesn't make any sense because it would tell me if I'm averaging two realistic images, I get something that is at least as realistic as one of the images I started with, which is clearly not the case from a practical perspective. With this, I'm at the end of my talk. I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions or propose solutions to the challenges I raised. Thanks. Thank you, Michael, for this nice presentation. We have a question from Jean Bernard, I think. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you for a very nice talk. And it, rem it reminds me the, the latest issue of Siam News on machine learning. It was uh, March, I think, or April where there was this especially uh, machine learning techniques for inverse problem, exactly as you are pointing out. And they were mentioning this instability theorem, uh, saying that uh, if, you are, if you learn very well, then you are unstable. There is a compromise, a trade-off, which is unavoidable. And it was very nicely explained with this Lipschitz constant of the input-output map, map of the network. Can you comment on that or? Yes, I think this is a promising direction to in, uh, enforce some kind of Lipschitz continuity. Now, from the perspective of energy minimization methods, um, we would expect a different metric. So typically, the way Lipschitz continuity is enforced in networks 
is by in, in an L2 sense. So L2 perturbations of the input should cause small L2 perturbations of the output. Whereas the corresponding robustness error estimates in energy minimization methods would take a very problem specific metrics, a metric for this Lipschitz continuity that is based on Bregman distances of the regularizer, in fact. So I see a challenge of adapting our understanding of Lipschitz continuity for neural networks there. Okay, we have a second question from Christian. Yeah, Michael, thanks for the talk. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to understand or point out, I don't know. I mean, there is some work in the maybe more AI literature on what is called constructed, uh, constructive machine learning, um, where they also think a lot about uh, parameterized loss functions or energy functions or whatever. And one part they were quite interested in is in getting a bit of a solution to maybe also what uh, was the question just a, a second ago by asking the human, the designer, uh, once in a while. And could that, I mean, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not now saying we just ask always humans and that's the solution to everything. But I think it's quite um, interesting to once in a while get a bit feedback on how should I change the loss function? And we don't do it in mathematical terms, but by asking questions about the examples. And so I was wondering whether there has been already some more work in that direction in the, in the computer vision um, community. So that is one part. And the other part is, um, I like the idea to say, let's learn the regularizer. Um, there's some other work on what is called probabilistic circuits, where people now make use of a tractable probabilistic model that can um, accommodate for logical constraints. And I think that might be also very interesting to ask how can we put general Sure, it's logic, I'm sorry for that, but um, constraints um, onto our problem, like whenever this happens, don't do that. Whenever that has happened, don't do that. And you can put even a bit of um, reasoning in there. So, but the, the first part is maybe more interesting. I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm wondering about that. Uh, yes, so thanks a lot for, for these comments. Absolutely, um, specifically, um, Okay, sorry, my connection just broke. Um, specifically, I think um, the issue of interpretability is hard to solve without humans, because really in terms of an L2 metric, the example I showed from MRI reconstruction, the network gets good scores. So it, it really depends on maybe even a medical expert to tell us what to look for and maybe provide some feedback in this sense um, to really get improve there and make it measurable or have some other type of feedback. Uh, I'm not so much familiar with, with works in this direction in the computer vision inverse problem community, to be honest. So, so what we were doing, but, but we can take it offline. Um, we were looking at explanation, visual explanations, and then you can check it. What I, I got reminded when you were showing, okay, here there's some part in the image that is reconstructed, but in the wrong way. And then you may just say, look, this reconstruction looks good, but it doesn't make sense. And you may have to shift it somewhere. And you put this bit of knowledge into your system again. In a sense, you're changing your loss function and the, the learner gets again motivation to keep going with learning. But yeah, let's take it offline. It's super interesting. Okay, yeah, I would love to because this is it. perfect. I, this is exactly what I'm interested in, combining knowledge that we have with machine learning. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for joining the lively discussion. We'll take a break now, about 15 minutes, and we'll reconvene at 1010 uh, uh, with the talk of Klaus Müller. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back after the coffee break and welcome to the second part of the Tuesday's symposium. So our first speaker is Klaus Robert Müller talking about machine learning meets quantum chemistry, please. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and thank you very much for organizing this, this wonderful event. Um, so I've enjoyed myself very much listening to um, the talks before. So today um, I will um, mainly focus on on uh, the, the sciences. So in Berlin, we have a high activity for machine learning in the sciences. Um, that is physics, medicine, and chemistry, which is what I will be uh, putting the focus of this talk on. Um, and I will talk a bit about the history of how this came about. Um, and the bottom line, um, which is also something that, that translates to other disciplines, not not only chemistry, is that you, you can include some knowledge, physical knowledge in this context, to obtain higher accuracy and less data. And, um, you know, and there are some disciplines, not computer vision, where you have um, few data points because they're very expensive. So what I'm talking about is highly interdisciplinary, and I will try also to, to show that from machine learning models, you can extract novel insights. And novel means that you didn't know them before. Um, so first is um, um, joint work with these people, um, Matthias Rupp, uh, Anatole von Lilienfeld, and Alex Kachenko, and, and many others. But they were the first movers. Um, and so the story was that we, I, I had my sabbatical in, in 2011 um, at IPAM, Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics at UCLA in California. And I, you know, this is a wonderful place to go. So if you ever get invited to this place, please accept. They have three month programs. And um, usually if you uh, come as a professor somewhere um, and have your sabbatical, then everybody around you is busy. And doing the standard things um, like teaching and minding their business. But in IPAM programs, there's typically a dozen professors from all over the world um, bringing some postdocs, um, and they are, you know, confined uh, to this, you know, terrible place in California <laughs> um, with nice weather all the time, and they have nothing else to do than to do great, great research. So when I arrived there, I, I realized that everybody around me was either a theoretical physicist or a chemist, and I was the only machine learning dude. And then they talked a lot about um, um, quantum mechanics, and I realized that I had a training in quantum mechanics back in the days, which made me young again. Um, so what they were talking about was Schrodinger's equation, and you see it next to the face of Schrodinger, uh, it's a very innocent looking uh, eigenvalue equation. But, you know, if you would naively solve it, you would have to solve a 10 to the 60 dimensional eigenvalue problem, which of course you wouldn't. And um, so this is really a beast, this equation. Um, and so what people do is they um, do some approximations. One is called density functional theory, and um, that got a Nobel Prize. So basically, you try um, to, you know, take whatever is you have, like a molecule or a, or a material. And um, if you have a molecule, then it, it consists of atoms. And atoms have some positions and some nuclear charges, Z and R. And um, that, that's what you put into the Schrodinger equation. And out you get some quantum mechanical properties like energies. So, so the idea of um, these, these approximations like density functional theory is that, that you, know, you do all first principle theoretical physics and in some point you make an approximation. And so I said, well, how, how about just not solving the equation, but rather predicting the outcome of the equation, which is of course something that typically you don't do and people in math and physics they don't really appreciate this. Um, and so this is what we suggested. And um, so essentially putting the same which goes into an equation 
into a, a machine learning model and predicting. And so just to say why this makes some sense is if you do um, density functional theory for a small molecule, it takes about three to five hours of computing time per molecule, per data point. And if you have a material, then it takes about four months of computing time. Whereas if this uh, stunt with the machine learning model would work, it takes less than a millisecond for a forward pass. So, so the way we, we went about was to, we, we uh, uh, coded, so to say, each atom by a nuclear charge and position. And um, then because you need to, to you know, describe a molecule in some way, and um, we described the molecule as a matrix, and um, then uh, which takes the differences between the positions of the atom of the i's and the j's atom, and you can recognize the Coulomb force here. Um, and so that gives the Coulomb matrix. This was the starting point that we, we thought about in this IPAM program. And then, of course, if you have two um, uh, features, um, then in this case, two matrices, you take the Frobenius norm, and then you, um, at that time, we took a kernel uh, 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 ridge regression model. So you put it into a kernel, and then you solve the kernel ridge regression model. So since you have, uh, you know, if you, if you can afford it, uh, you know, a few thousand data points, this is a piece of cake. So, um, the interesting thing is that we got quite nice results. So um, we arrived at out of sample predictions of quantum chemical properties uh, uh, about uh, quality of 10 k per mole at that time. Um, and this was surprising. But um, you know, more surprising is that we are now um, with more sophisticated methods be below one k cal per mole and precisely 0.2 k cal per mole. So out of sample. And so this means that within fractions of a milliseconds, we can explore uh, and predict across chemical compound space. So we, we gain the factor of um, something like 50 million um, and uh, uh, overall uh, by now and, um, and um, maintain precision. So if, you, if we dream a bit and uh, we saw the, the nice nebula of, of uh, Jan yesterday in the background. So, um, you know, people have been charting, uh, you know, the, the having been making maps of the stars throughout our times. But there is no map of chemical space. Chemical space is vast. Even if you take only small molecules, there's there's more small molecules than atoms in this universe. So because you, you, you know, to know their properties is completely unfeasible with standard quantum chemical um, procedures, but with machine learning, we couldn't start navigating this chemical compound space. So this is a huge uh, thing and machine learning play, plays a key role in this. So um, just to give you a bit bit of a background about more interesting architectures and kernel ridge regression. That, that was the first part. Uh, it was a tensor neural network by Christoph Schütt and collaborators. And um, here, basically, you <clears throat> the idea is a bit, bit like in, um, um, in embeddings, um, like word embeddings, we say in natural language processing, word to vec. So, so the idea would be to say, um, instead of learning to embed a word in this, its textual context, um, we try to learn how to embed certain atomistic properties in its chemical context. So um, across the graph of bounds that the, the, the um, molecule has. So basically, also again, we have the distances between um, the um, atoms, we have their nuclear charges, then we start embedding, and then we start um, um, adding interactions, and then we have a layered architecture, which, um, you know, for in the first step describes the atoms, in the second step, the bonds, in the third step, higher order interactions, and so on and so forth. And with that, we learn from the data how to embed 
this um, information and um, voila, there's the um, deep tensor neural network um, that has something like 0.3k kalpamol prediction quality. Now, the interesting thing, and um, I, since I'm not talking about this much, um, is that there is now a set of techniques that allow to explain what uh, neural networks actually do. And if you, if you do some um, neural networks in the sciences, you should be better know that it's, it's doing the right thing. It's not, you know, um, feeding of artifacts. And so, so it's it's highly important if you if you work um, in um, in in uh, in the sciences to really know that everything is 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 okay. And and so here we we analyze the, the tensor neural network and make these gummy bear plots um, that you can see the colorful ones. And and so in a way, um, it's it's we we compute something. That is, uh, and I put this in quotes, a chemical potential. So imagine you put yourself next to the benzene like here, and you would be a hydrogen. Then what our model gives us is, you know, what kind of chemical potential in the light of what the model has learned is, is experienced. And so this is something that, that was never, that the model was never trained for, but for a chemist, this makes a lot of sense. And of course, you can also do the same thing for materials, and you can see this down there. Now, um, having a new neural network architecture on one side, that's nice, but you know, you make chemists happy. The question is, you know, is this a one-way street where you use machine learning for chemistry and that's it? Or is it is something coming back also to machine learning? And so one of the things, um, this is another architecture, it's called the SCHNET. Uh, it's a convolutive uh, neural network. And typically in computer vision, you always have discrete filters. Um, and the, if you think about a molecule, how it's wiggling, then you can easily think about a situation where the atom position has changed, have changed just slightly, but the filter gives the same answer. And so we, we came up with the, concept of continuous filters and that actually made a huge difference in that context but you know going back there a number of people once this architecture was established um, have understood that you know they can perhaps use this okay so um so this is really a novel ml model uh and it was also appreciated in the in, in uh, the machine learning community. So, so if, you, if you would you know, do computations, then you know, on, a, on a silly laptop, um, you, know, you can do um, you know, very long trajectories um, of molecular dynamics um, you know, in seven hours, uh, which you can do before only in seven years of computing time on a supercomputer. So this is a huge difference at, of course, um, you know, uh, the same quality. This is the architecture. And so because I have been already using molecular dynamics as a concept, um, so what is this? And what is the machine learning problem there? So now we are not navigating chemical compound space, but we are actually analyzing a single molecule. So the single molecule, as I said, may, does dance, changes its configuration. And with every change in the configuration, it has different energy. So, so you can think of this um, um, 3n, n being the number of atoms, um, dimensional space with energy uh, values attached to it. And so um, what the idea is, is that you, you would like to sample this space and to understand um, you know, how, where the minima are and um, you know, what the, the potential energy surface is because if you take the gradient of this potential energy surface, you know where the molecule moves. And if you follow this gradient, then you have something which is called uh, molecular dynamics because you can yeah, see the molecule dance. But for this, you need the surface. So for a standard molecule like aspirin, you would need about 50,000 samples in order to get a decent surface. So if you think about this, uh, it's quite a lot of computing time. And um, if you 
if you um, um, then use this data, then you could um, could actually uh, do a regression model that you know makes you approximate this this surface. And once you have the surface, then molecular dynamics is a piece of cake because you just follow the gradient. Um, so one of the interesting things here is if you if you again do um, um, you take aspirin as an example, then typically you have about 50,000 um, um, uh, samples that you have to sample from your potential energy surface in order to do a decent reg regression. But if you remind yourself that in this universe, the law of energy conservation holds, this differential equation that you see in the middle of the, of the slide, then you can show that the architecture can be changed slightly um, but fundamentally, and you don't need 50,000, but only 1,000 data points. And if you, you know, take into account the, the uh, rigid and non-rigid symmetries of the molecule involved, then you, you only need 100 data points. Now, 100 data points of five hours, this is a piece of cake. But I, you know, these five hours uh, correspond to a um, you know, lightweight approximation of the Schrodinger equation. If you take what is called coupled clustering, um, um, coupled cluster solution, um, then it, it's, a, it's called CCSDT. Um, then it takes between one and seven days for such a molecule. So 50,000 times seven days, no way. <laughs> About 100 times seven days, that's okay. And so practically, um, we have been uh, training these force fields at the high accuracy of CCSDT. And that actually starts to coincide with the experiment. The, the lower, um, cheaper approximation don't. So this opens a huge new field. But the, the interesting point here is that you include physics and um, symmetries and invariances to get there. Um, and so let me just go to, to show you one video, which is some very other type of machine learning, and um, which is a collaboration that we did with our colleagues in Jülich. So, so probably uh, you have heard about these scanning probe microscopes um, and you can basically use them. You have some tip um, with which you can lift atoms uh, from a surface. And then you can write uh, funny things like Jülich uh, on the surface. This is real, right? Um, so you lift up an atom, and then you know this the, the atom is is gone from that part of the surface, and then you you can see, you do these funny writings. So um, the the thing is that you know our colleagues uh, Christian Wagen and Stefan Tautz they're very interested in in um, building stuff with uh, with atoms or with nanoparticles so you can lift up a single atom and you know build things but this takes a long time so so if you would be able to lift up a larger molecule like you know on the right and um, then it would be much easier because you could just do nano lego if you want right um and so what i Basically, what, what we're doing is we have some uh, molecules on the surface, and then there's this one atom tip that lift, tries to lift these, these uh, molecules. The problem here is that the lifting is difficult. <laughs> um, so a human who is very well trained can do this two or three times out of 50, right? So this is not very practical if you want to play nano logo, uh, Lego. Um, so what we did was we trained um, a reinforcement learning, again, with very few data points because there's not much uh, experiments that people can do. Every experiment takes about five minutes or 10 minutes. So that's not going to give you many data points. And then we can, we can actually um, have the reinforcement learning learn how um, to actually extract uh, the molecules from the surface and you can see a video from that.
And in the beginning, this doesn't work. The tip breaks off. And by the way, the tip changes at every time when it breaks off. Um, and so, uh, so you, you can see that the, the movement is actually uh, um, you know, not so trivial. And um, you, 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 with an appropriately trained uh, reinforcement learning algorithm, we are getting to this uh, uh, nice extraction. And um, we're now at, at something like um, uh, uh, 48 of out of 50 where we are successful. So that's a, basically a proof of principle that we can indeed play nano Lego. So um, I've told you a bit about the quantum chemistry. The physical priors, they are very, very useful. And um, they can be also, um, the, the, the concept can be also used in other co context. It makes chemists superbly happy to um, be able to have very accurate force fields. And um, um, of course, one important point is that we have to, um, you know, understand what our model does. And we have to make sure that it doesn't do any nonsense or clever hunts stuff. And um, and there's there's novel machine learning models that were um, motivated by physics, but you know came back to to uh, the neural network community and um, and uh, make people happy there. So thank you very much. If you want to read a book um, on on the snapshot of what we have been been doing. That's this one, or um, the explainable AI one is this one. So please, uh, if you have questions. Perfect. Thanks a lot for the very nice and interesting talk. We have uh, questions, but I'm afraid we have to uh, postpone them to the coffee break to roughly uh, stay in time. So um, I'm really sorry, Jean-Bernard Lasser, but uh, maybe we can postpone this to the break and uh, move on with your talk. I'm happy to um, um, ask, answer any questions. So just chat to me all. Perfect. That is also a good option. Okay. Got, um... Yes, so that is perfectly visible yes yes um, so jean bernard lasser will talk about the oh i'm christoffel dabung kernel for data analysis maybe yeah. i'm mispronouncing this please stage is yours okay thank you very much for the invitation and uh, i'm glad to to talk about this topic which is relatively new for me also uh, i've been working on that for let's say three four years only and it's a nice also uh, a realization of the French-German cooperation because these two guys on the left, you see Christoffel, he was in Berlin. I think it was from, it, he started this uh, school at the University of Berlin a long time ago, and then even Technical University of Berlin later on. And Darbu is a French guy also, so this is guy from the 19th century. And the CD, the talk is about exactly, you see this, this cloud of points that make the C of Christoffel, the D of Darbu, and the red line is the what is called the Christopher Darbu uh, polynomial. I will try to see uh, to explain how this tool, which is quite simple to 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 use, could be useful in some application in data analysis. So this is a joint work with that been done with uh, uh, two collaborators from one from France, Edouard Powells from Toulouse, and. Uh, Mihai Putina, who is in USC, UCSB in Santa Barbara. And this all about, all, all my talk uh, is based on material that you can find in this forthcoming book, uh, uh, should appear in the middle of this year. So just to introduce the topic, just consider a cloud of two, two dimensional points, uh, like the, you know, the, the points in the, in the figure above, and you see this red curve. It will be the, uh, the level set of some polynomial, which is quite simple to construct. And you see that it captures very well the, uh, the shape of the cloud. Okay. And, uh, and, and 
in fact, surprisingly, this uh, even with low degree D, because this, this polynomial is parameter by its degree, you can play with the degree of this polynomial. And the nice thing is that the uh, even with a low degree, you can capture the shape of many different clouds. You see a, a bunch of uh, a cloud of points, two dimen two dimensional points, and you see for each example. I don't know if you carefully see in the in, in the slides here, but you see the red level uh, curve. It's a, it's a certain level set of this polynomial, and you see that it captures very different shapes. So it's not a coincidence. So if you want to play with it, uh, you, you can do it very in, in a very simple manner. Uh, so you take you, you generate uh, any uh, any cloud of points. Of course, it has to make some uh, geometric shape to be to see some uh, uh, striking result. So you, you draw uh, your, your favorite uh, cloud of points. Okay. Once you have your data points uh, in 2D, um, you just construct this polynomial. You fix the degree D of your polynomial, and then you, you look at the, uh, the basis of monomials in two variables up to degree D. Okay, one, the linear terms, quadratic terms, and degree D terms. Okay. So then you construct the empirical moment matrix associated to the cloud of points. So you take each point, xi, you take the v, vd of xi, vd of xi transpose, and you make the sum. So it's empirical moment matrix. So you sum up over all points of your data set. So typically here, MD is empirical, uh, is empirical moment matrix associated with a measure mu n. Okay. Usually, the, the point could be drawn from some measure here, but just you, you, you don't even need this assumption. And now you form this polynomial of degree fixed D. So you invert the uh, empirical moment matrix, you take the inverse, and then you on the left and on the right, you multiply by this vector of monomials. So in doing so, you obtain a, a sum of square polynomial, and then you plot some level sets. You look at the set of x in R2, so that q of d of x is equal to gamma. And in particular, there is a, a very uh, standard uh, level set to look at, which is this one. And this level set is exactly what you see here. OK, let me go here. It's exactly this level set. So it captures the, the, the shape of your cloud of points. So in fact, the Christopher function it's a, reciprocal, it's, it's a reciprocal of this uh, polynomial. So it's one over this polynomial evaluated at x. Okay. And in fact, this is a, a, an old tool which is quite known in, uh, as a rich history in approximation theory and theory of orthogonal polynomials. And many contributors in, the, uh, in this domain are by uh, uh, Nevai, Totik, Crow, Lubinsky, Simon. But apparently, this Christopher function is not so well known in data analysis. And it's because maybe this tool was uh, in approximation theory and orthogonal polynomials is usually not associated with cloud of points, discrete measures. You start from the beginning from a measure and then you analyze some uh, uh, Christopher Darbo kernel, but you don't start from a, 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 data, a set of data points, which is discrete. So maybe that might be a reason why people in the two communities were ignoring each, each other. So let's start about some a little bit of uh, mathematical uh, setting. So uh, given a measure mu on a compact set omega in RP, so you are, you are given a set omega in RP and a measure mu on this set, okay, supported on this set. And then the, uh, the vector space of polynomial up to degree D can be viewed as a subspace of L2 mu. And it's a reproducing Carvel kernel Hilbert space, okay. And this reproducing kernel is just this one, a classical one. You take all the orthonormal polynomial p alpha up to degree d, and then you take this p alpha of x, p alpha of y, and you sum up about all orthogonal polynomial of degree at most d. This gives you a kernel, and this is what is called the Christopher Darbo kernel. So it's very classical, okay? And it's a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So what are the, the, the nice properties of this, uh, this Christopher function or this Christopher Darbo kernel? 
So one way to see the Christoffel function is just that the inverse of this uh, Christoffel function is just the diagonal of the kernel. Okay. And it has also some uh, variational formula. So if you take the point xi, no matter uh, where it, it doesn't need to be on a support, it could define everywhere in RP, right? It's just you look the value of this uh, Christoffel function at the point xi, it's just looking at the, uh, the, the polynomial of degree d that minimize p squared mu, given that it, but its value is one at the point xi. So it's another definition of the Christoffel function. But importantly, and for, for, for our applications, what is nice about this Christoffel function, and that's the main message to, uh, to be remembered, is that it identifies the support of the measure. This is the main point. And you see it's, it's summarized in this theorem that says that if you look at a point inside the support, okay, and the, uh, it behaves like the, the value of the, 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 the Christoffel double kernel or the Christoffel function at this point inside the support behaves like d to the power p, okay? p is the dimension of the space and d is the degree of your order. And what is more important, and crucial is that outside the support, when the point X is outside the support of the measure, then it has a, a, an exponential increase. It's growing like an exponential. So in, in other words, when you, if you increase the degree of your polynomial, then the Christoffel uh, function, which is the inverse of this polynomial, goes to zero very fast, which is not the case for when you are in the, in the support. So this, this, this Christoffel function is a way to discriminate the point in the support and the point outside the support. Giving the score of your Christoffel function, you can detect whether you are in the support or, out the, or outside the support. Typically what you have in dimension two, just to summarize, if you are inside the support, the Christoffel function behaves like d to the power p. Some, uh, some strange behavior, I mean, particular behavior on the boundary, but still polynomial, okay? And more, and which is, what is, which is uh, really important is that outside the support is an exponential growth, okay? Other results about the, uh, the Christopher function is that, for example, if you have a two measures mu and mu with the same support omega and these different densities F mu and F nu. What is nice is that under some weak uh, uh, assumption on the, on the two densities, the ratio of the two Christoffel function converge to the ratios of the densities, okay? And if you accept more restrictive assumption, and this is a conver point-wise convergence, and if you have more, more, even more restrictive assumption on omega, then you can even show that for, for one particular, uh, uh, you don't need a ratio, but each, uh, for each point xi in the support, then the Christoffel function is converging to the density of the measure mu times some density, which is proper to the set omega. It, it's intrinsic, intrinsically associated with the set omega, and it is called the equilibrium measure. And this, this kind of results can be useful for density approximation. Another thing which is nice is that if omega is not fully dimensional and is support on, on, on a real variety, for example, then if, you have a, if your degree is sufficiently large, not too large, depending on the degree of your variety, then if you look at this, the kernel of this moment matrix, empirical moment matrix I was mentioning, then this, the rank of this matrix behaves like a polynomial, which is called the Elbert polynomial associated with the variety. And so the degree of this polynomial gives you the dimension of the variety. So this is quite useful for manifold learning. Just by looking at your data and the rank of your matrix, you can have an idea when you see the evolution of this rank and it gives you the dimension of the variety on which your points are. So this is why this Christopher function could be useful for some application in machine learning. For example, for outlier detection, density approximation, money for learning. And in this case, since we are in data analysis, the measure mu is, is an empirical probability measure mu. And because it is associated with a cloud of finitely many points, 
And this is maybe why people have not, uh, in data analysis, not, have not looked at this uh, tool because this tool is usually associated with a, a, a classical measure on a compact set. Now, what is nice when you, when you have a, data point, a set of data points, computing the, uh, the, the Christopher function requires only one pass over the data and there is no, no optimization. I like optimization, but in this case, we don't need optimi optimization. And for instance, if you want to, to use the, uh, the Christopher function to detect outliers, it's just, for example, you take a, a point X anywhere in, in the plane, and then you evaluate its, its score with the Christopher function. And if the score is below some level, the red level in the picture was, uh, I was uh, showing at the beginning, then you decide that your size is an outlier. And then this very simple strategy, even with relatively low degree D, is as efficient as more elaborated techniques and with no optimization involved. Uh, we have some traces of these results in, in this uh, paper here. Uh, okay. It, well, uh, there are all the kernel in, uh, in, uh, in uh, machine learning which are not uh, Christopher Darbo kernel, not, not even polynomial kernel sometimes. And we can be very efficient to, uh, for calculating approximate, approximation of function in large dimension. The CD kernel cannot do that because it's still, even if the computation is simple, you cannot do to dimension, uh, let's say, uh, more than 20 or 30. However, this uh, kernel in the, in the uh, machine learning community, uh, like the Gaussian kernel, for example, are not related or at least directly to an underlying measure supporting support on the data points you are uh, dealing with. And what is the distinguishing feature of the CD kernel is its deep connection with the underlying measure. That's really the distinguishing feature of the CD kernel. It does not only encode the cloud of data points, but it also capture many essential features of the more complex measures support on the data points. So if you have a bunch of data points, but behind there is an underlying measure, if your points, of course, are drawn from this distribution. And the, the Christopher Darbu kernel, even with low degree, capture many essential features of this uh, measure. So you, well, in one way, it should be seen as another item in the arsenal of kernel method in machine learning. Let me show you uh, to, term, to, to finish the talk about the typical approach, uh, uh, how this can be used for approximating this continuous function, which is hard, uh, it's a hard topic, right? What would be a typical approach? Suppose you have a, here's a, a step function here in red and a typical approach uh, to, to approximate a function given by uh, some, uh, you know, only some sample or some moments would be to uh, approximate the function by a projection in some function space, for example, in, in L2 of, of mu, you, L2 of zero one, you would approximate this red function by this uh, projection on L2. And of course, this is, that this is nice, some nice property of L2 conversions, but it has some bad behavior in the sense that you have typical Gibbs phenomenon. So you have those typical oscillations that appear when you have a discontinuity point. There have been some other positive kernel with better convergence properties that have been proposed, still in the same framework of approximation. But those kernels have some nice property, but they, they, lost, they lose the reproducing property. So the, they, but they have nice, nice advantages. For example, they preserve positivity when you want to approximate a density. If you want to approximate a density with the oscillation approximation, you, the, the result could be negative at some points. So with this modified kernel, like Ferrier Jackson kernel, you can preserve positivity and still have better convergence property than the CD kernel. In particular, you can have uniform convergence for continuous function on arbitrary compact subset. Now, let me show you what uh, you could do also, uh, what you could do with the Christopher Darbo kernel, an alternative approach. Okay. The way they, they, they do it with the L2, L2 norm approach is, in fact, you approximate the Fn by this uh, uh, function F out of N, which is using the Christopher Darbo kernel. Okay? And this is produced the oscillations. 
Now, counterintuitive the two, instead of considering your function as zero, from zero, one to R, your, your density you want to approximate, okay? The set is, the, the idea is to consider the graph in R2 of F. So now instead of considering F on the real line, you consider the graph of F on R2. Why are you doing that? And, and now you consider the measure, which is not on, on the line, but it's on R2. It's a degenerate measure because it's just the, the measure which is supported on the on the on F, right? So in, in, it, it is a, a curve in R2. Why uh, should we that? As it implies going to R2 instead of staying in R. It's because now if you think at this measure, phi, the support of phi is exactly the graph of F. And it, we know that the Christopher Darbo or the Christopher function is very nice to identify the support of a measure. So if you now apply the Christopher Darbo technique to this new measure in R2, which is completely degenerate because it is supported on a curve, then you, you, you do what we did before for the cloud of points, right? You define this matrix, okay? This is sum of point xi, fxi. Now you are in, in two on the line for the point and f of x for, is on the y axis. You do that only on one pass on the, on the data. You compute the Christopher function. And then you approximate F by, at a point X, what is your approximation? It's just the arc mean of this function. You look for the Y that minimize this. And then you, 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 you get very nice point-wise convergence, L1 convergence as the degree D improves, okay? What we cannot do with the L2 approximation. And let me give you just an idea of how it works. For example, the step function here, you see, you, you don't see any oscillation anymore, even with very few, uh, uh, with a very small degree d, you find the exact uh, matching of the step function. And for example, this one is a very uh, nasty uh, uh, discontinuous function. And then you see, except here maybe, that you, you, you nicely approximate your function just by this simple tool of uh, inverting this moment matrix on the sample on the point on the sample of points of your function. Thank you very much for the attention. Perfect. Thanks a lot for the very nice talk. We have time for one quick question. Maybe one question from my side. So you showed uh, that the Christoffel's uh, Darbu function is very useful, for instance, for identifying the support of a measure. If I'm now considering this discrete case of samples um, from such a distribution, how am I still, or in what sense, or to what accuracy am I still able to determine the support of that measure? Maybe I, mean, I missed that part, but. Yeah, well, no, but, uh, well, of course, if, 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 you, if there is a nice, uh, in the case your measure is discrete, it's a sample from, um, a measure, then there is a compromise between the degree D and the, in, uh, the number of points in your sample. Because if you take uh, a few points in your sample and you take a very, very large degree, what would be the result? The result would be trivial. It would be just very small balls around each point. So, which would not be meaningful, give you no, it would give you no indication. So there is a, a nice compromise, which, is quanti which can be mathematically quantified how you should uh, the size of your sample and your degree to still, uh, when D increases and your sample, the number of points in your sample increase, you keep uh, this, this uh, empirical Christopher function is still uh, converging to the, uh, the, the Christopher function of the underlying measure. So there is, of course, a compromise to do that uh, to, if you have this asymptotic analysis. Okay, perfect, thanks. Yeah, thanks again. Then let's move on to uh, the, the final talk of this session. So Matthias Hein. Okay. Good, can we see it? Yes, perfect. So Matthias Hein will talk about out of distribution aware training for robust representations, please. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation and thanks a lot also for organizing this event. So 
I will present a bit of uh, work uh, on out of distribution detection, uh, which we have done in the recent years, where the focus is actually on getting reliable confidences uh, everywhere for a given classifier. And then in the second part of the talk, I will also show how this outer to distribution awareness actually also improves uh, subsequent tasks like uh, open world semi supervised learning. Okay, so we clearly have seen in the in recent years uh, tremendous success of deep learning in various applications like autonomous driving and personalized medicine. But what these applications have really in common and what makes this uh, also critical is to some extent that that they are safety critical. So we have, uh, yeah, errors can have fatal consequences, and that's why we have really high requirements regarding safety, robustness, and security. And despite their success uh, story of, of uh, neural networks, they, they also come with a lot of uh, problems. And one of the problems, and that's the main topic of this talk, is that they are overconfident for out-of-distribution uh, inputs. So what does that mean? So you, you train your classifier, let's say, on a, on a yeah, on CIFAR 10. This is, uh, yeah, and um, so, this noted here by this plane, and then you would get an indistribution image like this dog. And the classifier also predicts uh, this correctly as a dog and is very confident. So what I plot here is the predicted probability associated to this class. This is what I call here confidence. Now, the problem is that uh, if you in feed now uh, an out distribution image in into the classifier, which is completely unrelated, so it's not part of one of the classes, so this chimpanzee image is not one of the classes of CIFAR 10, then again, the classifier produces here a prediction of dog, which is clearly wrong and is very confident in this. And this is clearly a problem in safety critical system because the confidence of the classifier is not reliable for, for example, triggering human intervention or, let's say, in an autonomous car to transfer into a safe state of the system. And clearly, for example, in a medical diagnosis system, you don't want that let's say you get a new disease which which you have not seen before and which you clearly have not trained on that then the classifier assigns very high uh, um, confidence in a, in a given disease and basically this this unknown disease would for example be uh, be unnoticed in your system yeah so you really want then that the, that the system triggers that it has no idea what this is and then basically calls for human intervention now, um, clearly this problem has been uh, addressed, uh, and one of the uh, state-of-the-art methods is here this uh, outlier exposure, uh, which basically works by, uh, during training, you, you have an out-distribution uh, training set, and uh, you enforce basic uniform confidence on, on this out-distribution training set uh, yeah, during training. And then, again, you, you uh, get... Um, yeah, you predict well on the distribution, also achieve your high confidences. Now you also assign low confidence to this uh, chimpanzee image. So ten, this is a 10 class data set, so 10% would be uniform. So this is uh, very good here. But again, uh, the, this uh, outlier exposure is not adversarial ro robust in the sense of now you can, we can just try to maximize the confidence in a neighborhood around this given image. And again, uh, then this produces a very high confidence in, in the wrong class. Okay, before I basically come to uh, how we address this uh, in, in our works, I want to briefly explain why we have actually, or why this phenomenon of overconfidence is basically unavoidable. And for this, we basically uh, look now at the class of so-called uh, RELU networks. These are all networks which just use RELU activation function. But basically, these are all networks which in the end produce a piecewise affine function for each output unit of, of the classifier. And such a function is called a uh, piecewise affine if there exists a finite set of polytopes such that union of these polytopes is the whole set. Matthias, sorry to interrupt. Could you lower your volume? There is quite some resonance in, in the audio. Okay, yeah. A um, little bit. Sorry for that. Um, I guess I have to stop here screen sharing for a moment, sorry. Is it now better? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Good. Okay, so. <clears throat> yeah, and so, so you have this finite set of polytopes where the union is the whole uh, set and on each of these polytopes which are then called linear regions the function is affine 
And because, and, and here one sees basically the, here's, uh, is a restriction of, our, of the linear regions of a one hidden layer network in R2. And the problem is that because of you have you have a finite set of polytopes, one these polytopes basically have to extend to infinity, some of them. And on these polytopes, basically the, the classifier or the steep neural networks behaves then basically like a linear classifier. And this is exactly the problem which leads then to the statement here on, on this slide, uh, which basically um, yeah, says the following. So you can take any point in RD and any epsilon larger than zero. And then under a very, very mild condition on, on the network, on the weights of the network, uh, you, um, they, you, for any alpha larger than zero there and a class K, uh, you can construct an upscale vector set, yeah, alpha times X, such that for this upscale vector uh, set, it holds that you can achieve close to uh, confidence one, arbitrarily close to confidence one. And asymptotically, as you move basically to infinity, the classifier gets more and more confident. Basically, it, yeah, it gets asymptotically um, yeah, confident for sure. And this is exactly the opposite behavior of what you would like to have in practice, uh, uh, because as you move away from the training data, the classifier should get clearly less confident in its prediction. But here's exactly the opposite. Yeah? So you get more confident, which is clearly completely wrong. And this is not just related uh, to, to the radio function, activation function, but it can also be generalized to, to other activation functions which are frequently used in practice. Also, temperature rescaling, which has been uh, proposed for calibrating neural networks, does, does uh, not solve these problems. Now, clearly one can ask the question, are all classifiers like this? Um, uh, no, the answer, uh, there, there exist classifiers, which then as you move away from the training data, you, you get less and less confident. For example, RBF networks are one uh, particular example of this. So, but for, for uh, really neural networks, uh, it, it you clearly, in order to overcome this phenomenon, you really need to change the architecture uh, to solve this. Okay, but before I come to uh, methods, how we did this, uh, first uh, on to, uh, Propose this um, one way to mitigate this problem is basically that we do a kind of an adversarial training on the out distribution. So, what does that mean? So, here we have our normal in distribution loss. So, let's say just the cross entropy loss for our training data. And now we have here an additional term which tries to enforce uniform confidence. Now, just not just on the samples, on the out distribution training samples here set, but even in a neighborhood uh, around this uh, out of distribution uh, training sample. And um, the nice thing is that, uh, in contrast to adversarial training on the in-distribution, basically you do not lose much uh, prediction performance in this way, um, but you get basically uh, yeah, good um, now performance of or low confidence even in a neighborhood around our distribution points. And that one can see here now with the, this example. So now ACID would be the, the new method here. It performs again well on the in-distribution task. But now it produces low confidence on this uh, chimpanzee image and also in the, in the neighborhood around it, it produces low confidence. The problem of ACID clearly um, is that it, we have no provable guarantee. So we can just do empirical evaluation of this, but we have no provable guarantee. And if it really is about safety critical system, clearly the, the goal should be that we have in the end uh, provable guarantees on, on our machine learning system. So CCU, which I cannot explain in detail, is another method which we propose, which has comes with the asymptotic guarantee to have low confidence far away from the training data. But unfortunately, uh, this still does not imply that on close out distribution training sets to have this, uh, yeah, guarantees for for these particular points. And so the question is basically, can we guarantee low confidence even in the neighborhood of uh, close out distribution images? And um, the answer is yes. And for this, uh, basically what we are using is, uh, is a technique which has been proposed in, in certified adversarial robustness for, for the indistribution, namely interval bound propagation. And the idea is basically that then during training, we minimize an upper bound on the confidence in the neighborhood around any of our out distribution training points. And then again, we use a very rich out of distribution training set. Uh, and typically we always use the 80 million tiny image data set. Uh, which is then a proxy of, of all natural images to have a, a good covering of all possible uh, images. Okay, so what is this interval bound propagation? It's a very simple technique to get uh, guarantees. So basically you have uh, on the output of your neural network. So let's say you have a, a, your, your input uh, is now, a, let's say a wall um, a center 
method around a particular ins uh, instance x uh, and an infinity ball of radius epsilon. Now you want to basically control the output of your neural network, which it produces uh, on this ball. And for this purpose, you basically uh, derive the upper and lower bounds uh, for the output of each layer um, of the network and then propagate it basically form forward by this formula. You, so you get always the next upper bound and the next lower bound in, in this fashion using the upper and lower bounds of the previous layer. Okay, so while this technique is uh, gives actually super loose bounds, um, if you use it during training uh, for, let's say, adversarial robustness on the in distribution, then it yields currently one of the best guarantees uh, for certified adversarial robustness, even so there exist actually much stronger techniques or much stronger bounds uh, in the literature. But the fact is that if you use IBP during training, so use this bound during training, then this bound, even so it's loose, actually becomes tight for the network which you have trained on, and therefore it performs uh, so well. Okay, so this is the, what, what we are now using. And we are, as I said, we want to have an upper bound on the confidence in, in the neighborhood around a given point. So here we just write the log of the confidence using the softmax function. Uh, one can write it like this. And the, the key is that now in this expression, you just have differences of the logits. And this is exactly the form which you can now can control uh, using uh, IBP. So we control this difference uh, around in a neighborhood around a given point X using IBP. And this we then just plug in the formula for this uh, confidence function and then get an upper bound on the log confidence in the neighborhood of in the infinity neighborhood of, of this given point x. Okay, and then you basically just um, plug this uh, in, into this uh, expression here, which uh, has the effect that uh, because this blows up uh, in, in the initial phase of the training. So that's why we have here the logarithm, but uh, then during training, this becomes small, and that's why basically for small values, it behaves more like a square. That's why we have proposed this term here. And then you just minimize your normal training loss and your upper bound on the confidence uh, um, in this neighborhood on, on, of your outer distribution samples uh, during training. So this works very well, uh, but in particular for this 80 million training Im image data set, which we use as out distribution during training, the problem is that it contains actually a significant fraction of in distribution images. And then basically these terms are contradicting each other because this tries to enforce high confidence on in distribution uh, samples. And this tries then to for enforce basically low confidence on, on these samples. And uh, that leads clearly to a conflict. And uh, then also, um, yeah, deteriorates results. And therefore we have come up with this quantile version, which we basically just produce on the easily distinguishable uh, out distribution images then uh, our upper bounds yeah, where we enforce this epsilon um, yeah, really uniform confidence in a whole neighborhood whereas basically on the difficult ones uh, where, where our bound is high which are likely to be in distribution samples we just uh, don't enforce it just in a neighborhood but just really just on the points itself okay and this basically leads now really guarantees um, uh, for yeah, the first guarantees. So here's again this um, running example. So on the in distribution, it performs again well. On the out distribution, it performs uh, uh, predicts uh, low confidence. Also in a neighborhood, uh, predicts low confidence. But now the new feature is that you really have a provable guarantee uh, in in this neighborhood, so that you can say in a whole neighborhood, irrespectively of which image you will take, it produces confidence less than uh, this twenty two percent here. And so good is then the only method which can guarantee at the moment low confidence in a neighborhood around close out distribution images. Okay, so this was the part on out distribution detection. So now I want to switch gears a bit. Um, so as I said, out distribution, uh, we need this out distribution awareness basically uh, in safe figuring systems. On the other hand, as I want to show now, out distribution awareness uh, leads also to better results for, for other uh, problems where maybe safety critical uh, or safety is not such a big issue. And the uh, application I want to discuss now is semi-supervised learning. Yeah, semi-supervised learning came with the promise to deal with large amounts of unlabeled data. Um, but in fact, most semi-supervised learning methods work with a closed world assumption. That means that they assume that all the unlabeled data comes actually from the in-distribution. But if you think about uh, that you want to retrieve, let's say, a large amounts of uh, images or text from, from the web, it will be clear that you cannot control that all these samples will be from, from the in-distribution. So that's why semi-supervised learning, at, at least if you want to really learn with large amounts of unlabeled data, 
in the wild, it will be from in and out distribution. So we really work in an open world setting. And the question we posed ourselves is that, can we leverage these large amounts of unlabeled data to improve classifiers? In particular, even when we have already a large data set, so for existing benchmark data sets. And the answer is uh, yes. Even, even this most simple method like self-training uh, is actually sufficient, but it has to be out distribution aware. And let me quickly show how, how this out distribution awareness uh, works here. So this is a standard set, uh, or this is a self-training uh, scheme. And all the uh, parts which are now uh, specific for this out distribution awareness uh, are highlighted in blue. So basically the base teacher, uh, there we use already in, um, basically outlier exposure for training. So we enforce uniform confidence on an out distribution training samples. Then we calibrate uh, the resulting teacher classifier on the in-distribution validation sets so that the pseudo labels which we produce are really uh, calibrated. And then uh, we select always in each round the top K unlabeled instances with highest confidence for each class. But we have so-called uh, in and out distribution thresholds uh, based on uh, in and out distribution validation sets, which tell us how, how many samples we are allowed to take in in order not to make basically a lot of errors in our in our the samples which we add to our training set. And then we just produce uh, the pseudo labels on the samples which we add and on all the other instances which we don't add from the unlabeled data set, we produce uh, uh, here a mixture of uh, uniform confidence and basically our predicted soft labels. So we basically still downlabel uh, the unlabeled instances which we do not think to be task relevant. And then you just repeat this process until the validation accuracy uh, increases. And the interesting thing is that in the, in the challenge setting now where you uh, have, let's say, just a small amount of unlabeled data, like here, uh, 4,000 labeled data for Cypher 10, which is roughly 10% of the training set. Um, now, the unlabeled data is then just uh, the rest of the training images from, from Cypher 10 plus uh, restricted 1 million or 10 million unlabeled images from, from this 80 million tiny image data set. So the task relevant samples is really low in this case. And so it's really challenging because uh, so there's a lot of potential to make errors when you add these samples to the to the training set. And in fact, all the uh, or most of the established semi supervised learning methods cannot deal with this setting. So they perform even worse than if you do just train here on on the label data uh, set, which is uh, uh, given here. But even uh, established method for open world semi 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 supervised learning, which improve your performance. If you look now carefully what they actually select as samples internally, which is shown here at the bottom, you see actually that they think a lot of samples which are completely untask, not task related um, are actually added to the uh, training set. And this poses really a problem so for AI safety because you basically have an inher in inherent uh, distribution shift, which you don't even notice when you just look at test performance. In contrast, our auto distribution of our self training selects mostly just really samples which belong to this task and uh, basically then also improves performance. And even more striking is that even now on, on benchmark data sets, so uh, where it's actually quite difficult to still imp improve uh, on, on, uh, if you use the full data set of CIFAR 10. Uh, this auto distribution where self training can improve yeah, here by, by 2% on CIFAR 10 and or more than 5%. Uh, uh, yeah, roughly 5% on CIFAR 100. And um, up to my knowledge, this, these are really also the best uh, results which have been reported for this rather small architecture for uh, ResNet 50. We have repeated this experience also with larger architectures like a permit net, where we still get gains, but clearly uh, the gains are then uh, smaller than, than for, for the ResNet 50 architecture. Okay, yeah, with that, I want to conclude. So I, I think this worst case adversarial perspective is really needed for out of distribution detection and safety critical systems. And we really need also guarantees there um, because reliable uncertainty estimates are essentially when we use machine learning in a scientific and industrial pipeline. And as I've shown, this out of distribution awareness is, is not just uh, important in, in AI safety, but it's also important, uh, for example, in, in this open world uh, simplified learning uh, task. Um, regarding adversarial robustness, this is a common problem that often evaluations are, are bad and therefore I just want to basically advertise here our outer attack uh, suite, which is a completely parameter free uh, attack um, and therefore uh, and has been shown to be a very reliable evaluation of adversarial robustness. 
yeah, with that, uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot for the very nice talk. Um, maybe I can start with one question from YouTube. So regarding RBF networks, what do you think of the idea of using kernels as activation functions to address extrapolation errors or overconfidence? Um, yeah, this this is a this is a very good idea. Um, basically, the approach which I did not have time to uh, talk about uses uh, a, a Gaussian mixture model, which it integrates basically into the last layer. Uh, and this Gaussian mixture model allows us then actually control of the conditional distribution, and therefore we can actually then give this provable guarantee that uh, the classifier produces low confidence far away from the training data. Uh, if you would just use an RBF network on the last layer. You could not directly prove this because uh, you still have basically the, the network below you, uh, below the last layer, which you cannot control. Yeah? So you need something which you can uh, control. And um, that's why this is definitely a good approach and it will work nicely, but it's not, uh, um, yeah, it will not give any provable guarantees. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Maybe we can officially. Oh. Okay, Thomas Box, please, one more question. <clears throat> yeah, I have a question because uh, you're now enforcing that if you're far away from the training samples, you become uncertain. This is, of course, something that you not necessarily want. You also want to generalize. So if you're um, far away or a bit away from the samples, um, but maybe between two samples that belong to the same class, you maybe still want to be certain that uh, you might be right there. So. Did you observe any drawbacks from your guarantees in, in, in classification and generalization? No, actually, uh, the nice thing is that this uh, typically, if you train this outlier exposure, it performs even better than uh, standard training. So you are not mm -hmm. losing any any performance. And uh, having low confidence does not mean that your prediction is wrong, right? It just means that you flag that you are less certain about your prediction. And I think this is this is definitely a, a good feature if you think about whatever medical diagnosis systems and so on. Hmm. So you still assign the class label it just as lower confidence than in the output. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. So thanks a lot. Uh, let's go into a 13 minute coffee break. And also, uh, of course, internally, feel free to use the time for further discussions uh, we, we couldn't have after the talks. Thanks.
Hello, salut und hallo. My name is Florian Bernhardt and I will be chairing this session. So it's my great honor to introduce our next speaker, which is Thomas Brox, who will talk about fostering generalization in single view 3D reconstruction. The stage is yours. Yeah, thanks. So um, yeah, I will present a work here, which is about fostering generalization. And in particular in single view 3D reconstruction, that's an issue as we'll see in a minute. So this is joint work with uh, Bosch um, and uh, the line of work that we did here also dates back to some time when I worked with Interlab on that uh, and Interlabs on that problem. Um, so in the past, uh, since we have learned that um, you can use deep networks to map anything to anything, uh, single view reconstruction has become very popular. So uh, especially you can get nice depth map reconstructions from single images. So this is a work from, from Ranftel and, and colleagues. Um, which also generalizes quite well to, to scenes because it was trained on a very large data set. So that's one strategy that you can use. But even then you see that there are some issues in small details. And then there's the other problem um, where you want to reconstruct full um, 3D shapes from the single images. And also that gives you nice uh, um, reconstructions on first glance. Um, but as we'll see, um, this only works more or less in distribution um, and not for, for new object classes. And uh, the talk here will focus on, on this uh, object shape reconstruction. So um, we were a bit skeptical when, these, when we got these nice results and everything looked nice and we didn't really understand how the network does it. So we looked a bit deeper into that. Um, and um, although you never know how networks do things, um, for sure, uh, we can um, at least uh, get some indication of what might be going on. So what we did uh, is we compared a couple of um, state-of-the-art reconstruction networks from that time. So this Atlas Net, um, then this OGN and Matryoshka networks. Um, and we analyzed, we compared their behavior to some simple baselines that you know from pre-deep learning eras. Yeah, so, so this is just a baseline that is built on clustering the shapes, uh, the training shapes, and then just representing each cluster by a mean shape. And then you could just train a classifier to classify from uh, given the, the single image of which cluster uh, it should be. Yeah? And uh, then you get actually this result and you see that it looks very similar to what you get with all these deep networks here. And what we also found that with some simple image retrieval, you actually get much nicer results than, than with all these networks. Also the very classical way of just doing uh, either image retrieval or um, then if you have the Oracle, then you can also test shape retrieval. You get actually much better results than, than what you get here. So what you actually learn from this is that um, all these contemporary reconstruction networks, they mainly interpolate between mean shapes and they don't really reconstruct any shape. And you're also seeing that from missing details, like for example, the handles of the motorcycle. Um, so what is the consequence of this? Um, first of all, it gives you very little generalization to unseen shapes. So even um, if you provide the ground truth depth map, so actually the ambiguity from just the depth is, is no longer there because you provide the, the ground truth, even then um, reconstruction is poor if you test this on unseen shapes. Yeah, so here, this was trained on lamps only um, and then tested on motorcycles. And you see, even though you, you know the ground truth depth map, you get a quite weird um, shape reconstruction. And what you also find is that the mean shape destroys all the details as, as we have seen, like the handles of the, of the motorcycle. Um, so here's the problem that we want to look at. So given a training set with um, some depth map and shape pairs, yeah, for example, the depth of some chairs and then the 3D shape of the, uh, the chair. Um, for some object classes, um, we want to um, find a 3D shape from a single view depth map on unseen shapes. Yeah, and um, so while the normal methods, they um, get some novel instances as, as test input um, and then want to produce the, the shape for that, we actually want to do this for novel classes. Um, so unseen classes. Um, and that follows also the, the earlier work from of genre, um, which already set up something like that on object classes. What we added to that is also new arrangements of objects. 
Um, so for example, having two uh, chairs next to each other or a sofa and a table and all these combinations. And especially these new object arrangements also um, show quite well that there is an issue in the way on how these uh, reconstruction networks currently um, solve the problem. Um, because even if you train on the same object class, so in this case chair, um, and you provide the ground truth depth map, um, you don't get a reasonable reconstruction of these two chairs. Yeah? So even then the generalization does not work to the new arrangements. Um, it's just because the, the learned global prior dominates everything. So it has just seen single chairs and not two chairs. And that's why it always will produce a single chair. And if it's two chairs, then we'll just make a bench out of it. And um, so that's why this object arrangement setting um, showcases this, this problem quite well. And what it also shows is actually the importance of recombination, which goes also a bit beyond um, uh, this particular problem of single view um, 3D reconstruction. Um, if you don't reuse partial information, that means that a network must see all possible combinations during training. Also in the case of the two chairs, if you, even if you have seen two chairs during training next to each other, if you then move one chair, um, it's a new configuration. And if you want to generalize to that, you also have to see this um, configuration if your method cannot recombine um, the partial information. And you can think a little bit of why convolutional networks actually work because there is some recombination going on at the patch level. Um, and the ability to recombine is actually a prerequisite for generalization um, because it replaces the exponential scaling in the number of training samples to a linear scaling. And it seems that uh, the training setup that we have here in this single view 3D reconstruction does not foster learning of local shape priors at all. Um, and that means not, there's nothing that can be recombined. So now that we know the problem, it's relatively easy to fix it. So uh, the idea is that you train network to reconstruct rather than the full object, local blocks. Yeah? So you can just take local blocks from your um, input image and then reconstruct the 3D um, blocks um, with the network, just like you do that for the global shape. Yeah, and then you can, um, uh, built together uh, the whole object or also a whole scene as the combination of the local reconstructions. And you see that this works pretty well um, and uh, even gets you some relatively nice smooth shapes um, with quite many details. Of course, there is an issue with that. Um, the downside of this local reconstruction is that you are missing global consistency. So on the visible side of the object, that's still okay because there we had all the depth information. So reconstruction is, um, is quite good already. But on the invisible side of the object, you see that um, the different local priors, they are not consistent. So they don't agree with each other. And that's why you get a relatively weird um, shape surface there. Um, so you can fix this by applying a global prior. And what we do here is actually simply a multi-scale ensemble. So instead of just having one block size that we consider, we actually consider multiple of those. So smaller ones, bigger ones, and then also the global shape. And for each of them, we train a, a small network that does the reconstruction at that patch level. And then we just sum up the, the results to get a, a final global shape. And with that, you see that you, you would get different reconstructions from these different networks and uh, the combination then gets you typically the best of, of both worlds. And you can now test on how well this works and compare this to uh, the global priors that are um, typically used. Um, so this is now trained on um, three different classes, chairs, planes, and, and cars. Um, and then you provide a lamp as input and yeah, you see with a global prior, the network is completely confused because it doesn't fit to any global prior that it knows. And you just get this, um, this bubble here. Um, whereas if you combine the local and global priors, then you get a reasonable reconstruction. Of course, it looks better from the visible side than from the invisible one um, because you have the ground truth depth map here as input. Uh, so it's easier there, um, but uh, yeah, the overall reconstruction is reasonable. And here's an example of uh, training only on chairs and then just showing chairs, but in an arrangement of two chairs. And whereas the global prior again converts this into um, 
a fancy uh, single chair um, that doesn't look very reasonable, um, you get a very nice reconstruction with the global and global price together. You can also cover this in numbers. So um, we compare here um, this global network, so occupancy networks, that is our baseline that we also use for our hierarchical uh, prior networks. Um, so that's the global prior. Then there is another work that recently came, uh, which also uses some local um, implicit functions but they don't enforce the learning a local prior. And that's why they cannot really benefit from the locality. So the recombination doesn't work at the prior level. Um, and we have here in the red part here, the um, setting where you trained on chairs, airplanes, and cars. Um, and you see on the unseen objects. Um, so this is all an F score. Um, so this metric that is typically used here for comparing the quality of the shapes. And you see there's a large improvement if you use these hierarchical prior networks, um, both for unseen object and for the object compositions, especially for the object compositions, the gap is even larger. And um, if you only train on lamps, then you also see that the difference is actually not that large anymore. So thanks to these local um, priors, you actually don't need all these different classes to get a reasonable reconstruction. Um, but of course, you also benefit from the global prior. So if you are in distribution, so if you have a global prior of the actual object, then of course, on the uh, invisible side, you will get a better reconstruction than if you don't have that. Yeah, but um, even if you don't see the object at all, you get a reasonable reconstruction now. We also tested this on some real world um, depth maps. So not only the ground truth ones, although that was not the focus of our work um, in initially, um, you see that also here, um, you can get some reasonable results. Although here, um, of course, there's very little information in the depth map and in the prior because it hasn't seen the object class before and it hasn't seen um, the, uh, and the depth map is incomplete. So of course, then also the reconstruction is, is limited, but um, it makes some sense. One thing that I want to um, highlight also is that um, the locality improves the data efficiency quite dramatically. Um, so if you compare here the local, uh, the global um, prior uh, network and here the, the local one with a patch size of 64, um, and this is at the log scale, then you see that already with 1% of the training samples, uh, the local network actually flattens out. So it has seen enough data to, to do its job. Um, and uh, this is just because, first of all, it uh, enables the recombination. So that means you anyway generalize better. So you need fewer training samples. And secondly, also um, because you're cutting out these um, small patches, you actually increase the effective training set size. Yeah? Because of these local blocks, you have multiple of these blocks uh, in a shape. So you can effectively more data than if you uh, only have one sample uh, per image. Okay, so to summarize, um, um, I highlighted uh, that uh, the ability to recombine is, is key for generalization. This holds true in on all the tasks, but um, it's particularly evident here on this uh, single view reconstruction. Um, and we have seen that locality and single view reconstruction enables this recombination. And locality also requires much fewer training samples for two reasons, mainly this uh, better generalization due to the recombination, but also because we effectively have a larger training set size. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas, for this nice presentation. So I think we have plenty of time for questions. Are there any questions? Okay, there's a question by Christian Kersting. Yeah, so coming back, so thanks for the talk. Um, coming back to the argument from yesterday saying that um, we don't just need uh, world knowledge, but world models. Is this work also showing that we should not just talk about models, but maybe use knowledge to combine priors local priors on the fly so that this might be the glue between the different models that we may have to combine at some point. Does that make sense or should it be the whole models? Yeah, so um, 
I'm not sure if I if I am on the same on the same page already, but um, so if you want to model the world, since the world is complex, you cannot do without recombination. So that means you you cannot build a global world model prior. Um, uh, in that sense, this, this this work also fits in there, yeah. So because you actually have to decompose the world into recombinable parts, learn those, and then also learn how they have to be combined to make models um, that that you have seen, yeah, um, or that makes sense. And so in that sense, you have to bring the, the the local recombinable parts together with the with the global knowledge. Yeah, and, and I was and wondering. I mean, it's yeah, a lot about one of the challenges. It's a, a lot about inductive biases that we have to capture somehow, right? And seems like the inductive biases are maybe a lot driven by local priors. And I was wondering how much this can give us some form of modularity already, without already trying to combine arbitrary models. Um, and maybe the 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 priors are a bit like the interface layer that is much easier to handle. Mm -hmm. I mean, super high level. I agree. I mean, nothing concrete now, but yeah, yeah the okay. inductive bias sometimes is um, it's not clear what the inductive bias of a of a network architecture or actually also of a training scheme is. Yeah, so because the architecture here, it's typically an encoder decoder architecture. So from that point of view, there would be the way it would be possible to recombine. Yeah, so there's there is no point. It's just that because of the training setup that you always learn from these global shapes, there is no fostering of this uh, recombination and um, learning of local priors. So that's why you have to consider actually both the inductive bias of the uh, architecture and the inductive bias of your training setup. And often mm -hmm. the training setup is, is more important than the architecture because what we see actually does, Meanwhile, that you can use whatever architecture, if it's not completely dumb, it will work. Um, it's more about how you formulate the, the learning task, whether it will give you something reasonable or not. And in mm -hmm. this case, it was definitely the, the learning task setup that was not right, because as network, we actually use the same architecture as the others. Yeah, so we didn't change anything there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, there's also a question from YouTube. I'm just reading it. How about having some data fidelity term? For example, there should be a projection of the mesh which matches the depth map, I guess similar to what was proposed for image reconstruction by Michael Mellon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so in this uh, field of um, depth reconstruction, there were also some reprojection-based methods that reproject the 3D shape to, um, to the image and then can argue in, in the image space. Um, so we have also played a little bit with that. Um, and there, of course, you, yeah, you get some um, you get some direct feedback, um, whether your reconstruction makes sense or not on the training data. But again, it on the training data, the things work. So your reprojection error will also be small. Um, so in that sense, it doesn't help. It only helps if you, um, yeah, it doesn't help you on new test samples because there you don't have the relationship. Does yes, that make also, sense? Oh, no, you know the, the depth map, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so if you project back, you would see in the depth map that it doesn't work. Um, but during training, um, that would just make sure that your, that your depth map projection is consistent, but it wouldn't help you in the, um, uh, in the invisible parts. There's also another question on YouTube asking, what is the difference of your work and the work patch nets from ICCV 2020? So the difference is that um, we really enforce learning these local priors. Yeah, so there have been a couple of works that do um, uh, that use some locality um, in the representation. So also this other work that I mentioned here. Um, so uh, this one from Genova, that is CVPR 2020. Um, they also used local functions, but they didn't um, enforce the learning of the local priors. And that's why they cannot actually perform better on the unseen objects. So again, from, from the um, re um, representation setup, everything is fine, but not from the training setup. Okay, and one more last question from YouTube. How does the query time of your approach to reconstruct an object from a depth field compare to the vanilla ONET? Um, so runtime is, well, 
because you have multiple networks, um, it scales by the number of networks that you have in the ensemble. Um, potentially, you can make these networks a little bit smaller because yeah, I have multiple of those, especially those here that only reconstruct um, local patches can be probably smaller. Um, yeah, so currently we use the same network everywhere. So there it's just a linear scaling with the number of, of networks that we use. Okay, thank you very much for the nice discussion. We should now move on to the next speaker who will be Julien Meral. Can you st please start sharing your screen? Yes, I can just... Okay, so you should see it now. Okay, great. So Julia will talk about Lucas Canada Reloaded end-to-end -end super, super resolution from raw image burst. The stage is yours. Well, thank you. So first, uh, thank you very much for organizing this uh, very nice workshop. So I'm going to talk about super resolution. And more precisely, we are going to use the Lucas Canada algorithm, which was invented about 40 years ago uh, to align two images. So if you are from computer vision, you should probably know about this algorithm because we can probably say that it was for a long time, one of the very few computer vision algorithms that was actually working in the real life. And uh, before I, I go further, I would like simply to show you a picture of my collaborators because this was in fact the work of my uh, PhD student, uh, Bruno Lecoeur. Uh, can you see the, yes, okay, there is a small delay. So this is the work of my PhD student, Bruno Lecoeur, who is co-advised uh, with Jean Bons. And uh, to explain uh, more precisely what uh, we want to do here, I'm going to do as in a life science papers, which is to start with some results. And so uh, here, this is a picture that was taken using a Panasonic camera. And our goal is simply, given a scene like that, to be able to zoom on the small squares and increase the quality of what uh, we see here. Now, that what you don't see at the moment is that when you zoom, we see that in fact this picture was taken with a low exposure time. So that means that the signal is pretty weak. It has to be amplified to, to reconstruct a color image. And when you amplify a signal, you also amplify the noise, such that the camera has to work very hard to remove the noise, reconstruct the color image from the raw sensor data, and it will lose lots of information in the process. So this is here the output of the camera. But if instead you are able to take multiple frames of the same scene and combine the information from the burst, this is the types of results that we get uh, which I hope will uh, appear nicely on your screen if uh, Zoom does not add compression artifacts. So here, I simply take my camera, I press the shutter, and instead of taking a single scene, I will take 30 uh, frames. And by combining information from these frames, I recover lots of uh, nice information. For example, here, you can see lots of tiny details that were impossible to get from a single image. So another result here. So, so on this other part of the picture, we can also recover very fine details, such as the hair of Elsa, and also some parts of the picture were overexposed. We can also recover some information. Now, the last example before I proceed with the, the method is it's another part of the scene. So I like this one very much, not because it uses a some uh, a bottle of rum, so I'm not a big fan of using alcohol for scientific presentation, but from an image processing point of view, it's a very interesting image that contains lots of very fine uh, details that are very hard to recover. If you, if you look at the output of the camera on the left, it's impossible to read anything, okay? So before I present the method, it's Im important to mention that here we are working with the raw data from the sensor. And if you are not familiar with how a camera processes sensor data, I will give a very simplified view. So basically, there is the first thing to know about sensor data is that for each pixel, you don't get the full color information. There are tiny, small colored filters in front of every pixel organized on a, on a particular pattern called the Bayer pattern. 
represented here by this sequence of green, red, green, red pixels, then blue, green, blue, green. And the task of reconstructing a color image from this partial information. So it's already an inverse problem where you need to interpolate. This task is called demosaicing. And because the sensor data is very noisy, then we need also to denoise. So if we are going to combine information from multiple frames, working with raw data is in fact very important. Why? Because like I showed you before, the camera image signal processing unit, which does its best, uh, is losing lots of information. Now, working with raw data has also another advantage, which is that we can leverage aliasing. And uh, I don't know if you see the picture yet, but uh, aliasing is a very basic phenomenon from signal processing, which says that uh, if you have a high frequency signal and you undersample it because your sensor has a specific resolution, you are not going to see these high frequencies. What you are going to see is some low frequency artifacts. And this is something that appears in the, in the real life. For example, on the right, you should see a burst of uh, images. And uh, there is a very high frequencies in this signal, so such that you see some uh, bluish or orange uh, artifacts. So this is typically aliasing. So if you deal with a single image, aliasing is bad. It's known as something bad. And it is so bad that, in fact, on many cameras, there is an optical filter in front of the sensor that will remove high frequencies. So typically, we don't like these types of, fit of uh, filters. Now, if we deal with multiple frames, aliasing is, in fact, something good. And it is something which is well known by people who have actually worked on this topic. And intuitively, it's very simple. What is aliasing? It's nothing else than a measurement of high frequencies. And if you have multiple measurements, then there is hope to recover the true signal. So our goal will be to exploit these types of uh, high frequencies hidden in the data, combine information from multiple frames to reconstruct a high resolution image. So this task is in fact pretty hard for several reasons. One of them is that we take the picture by hand, by taking the camera by hand, and there is motion. There is hand motion that we need to take care of. That means that we need to align these images with sub-pixel accuracy. Then you also need to deal with noisy data, such that you need to do blind denoising in your case, meaning that you have some amount of noise. You don't even know how much noise you have. You have to deal with it. We have also to reconstruct color images from the Bayer pattern. We have to do demosaicing. And on top of this, we want to do super resolution. So there are lots of prior work on super resolution. So I don't want to do a survey for this um, short presentation. I'm going simply to mention this uh, nice paper by ETH, uh, Bat et al., which adopts uh, a deep learning uh, method. And uh, when you think about it, uh, applying a deep learning model for this task is actually a bit complicated. And one of the reasons is that from an experimental point of view, it's actually impossible to acquire very high quality training data, meaning it's actually impossible to take at the same time a high quality, high resolution color image and uh, low resolution raw frames, a burst of, uh, of uh, raw frames. And uh, why is that? Simply because there will be always misalignments between the ground truth and the, the raw frames. Nevertheless, there is also a very nice uh, protocol in this paper that is uh, using quite realistic way of generating synthetic raw data from high quality color images. And we are going to benefit from this work. Now, something that will uh, sound familiar given the discussion of yesterday, given the talk of uh, Michel Muller, is that we are going to start by looking at the problem from the old world point of view of classical inverse problems, meaning that we simply consider the way the data is generated. So for example, take a high quality color image X, we are going to assume that the burst that we observe, the raw data, is generated from X by applying a sequence of operators and by adding some noise. And so these different operators are the following ones. You have WPK, which is a warping operator that is, in your case, an affine transformation of pixel coordinates parameterized by six parameters. 
And this model is in fact pretty good if we deal uh, to model hand motion, if we only, if you are only interested in uh, local crops in zooming on small parts of the image. So after you do your warping operator, we need to reduce the resolution. So both spatially and also in the spectral domain because of the Bayer pattern, such that you have an integrator B plus a subsampling operator D. So after you have this uh, image formation model, it's becoming very natural to formulate it as an inverse problem where you want to minimize this cost function with respect to X, with respect to the motion parameter. And because the problem is not necessarily well posed, you also need a good image prior. For example, here in the old world, we may use total variation and then you optimize. So there are plenty of ways of optimizing this. We are going to choose a very simple approach, which is a penalty method that consists of introducing an auxiliary variable Z, which has to be as close as possible to X. So we have a quadratic term here with a parameter mu T, which is going to increase along the iteration such that when we proceed, Z becomes closer and closer to X. So why we do that? Simply because after doing this, it's becoming very natural to use a block coordinate descent approach to minimize the objective. And here comes the first interesting fact, which is that if you fix X and Z, and you minimize with respect to PK using a Gauss Newton algorithm, then you recover the Lucas Canade algorithm from 1981. And in fact, I should say that Lucas Canade is not only Gauss Newton, it's also um, the result of a huge engineering effort, which is extremely useful for us. There are lots of implementation tricks that make it robust and fast. So now when we look at the other, other variables, if we minimize with respect to X, it requires computing the proximal operator of the prior phi theta. If uh, I'm minimizing with respect to Z, it's a simple quadratic function. So there are plenty of ways to do that. In our case, we, uh, we, we simply do very basic gradient descent steps and mu T increases over the iterations. So the advantage is the robustness of this approach and the interpretability, it solves what it is supposed to solve. If we change the types of data, it will still solve the same problem. The drawback is that designing a good image prior by hand, it's actually very hard. So here comes then the new world of deep learning models where we encode a form of prior knowledge in the model architecture. For example, if you use a convolutional neural network, you implicitly assume that there is some local stationarity in images at multiple scales. And this gives us the ability to train the model parameters theta end to end if we have training data. And very often for inverse problems, once you have the right model, the right setup, the right data, you achieve state-of-the-art results. So this is adaptive to the task. And one of the drawbacks we have heard about this already is that you learn a model which is tuned to a specific data distribution. When you go out of this distribution, bad things can happen. So now bridging the two worlds uh, together, we have seen uh, already that in a, in a previous presentation. Well, there is one thing we are going to do is to adopt the classical point of view of inverse problems. And the first thing we do is that we are going to replace the proximal operator by a parametric function which is good to uh, remove artifacts. And for that, we use a convolutional neural network. Now, why does it make sense to replace a proximal operator by such a parametric function? There is one reason, which is just intuition. So what is the intuition is that the proximal operator, its role is to remove artifact, artifacts. It takes as input Z, it provides X, which is closer to what a natural image should be. Then the other thing that could justify this is that from an optimization point of view, many of, this, uh, of the optimization proofs for these optimization methods in a non-convex setup, they only require the proximal operator to be non-expensive to converge. And this is something we can also do using a convnet. We can constrain the weight such that the convnet is also non-expensive. So I'm not claiming that this is something we did here in this work. The second idea is the idea of unrolled optimization. So we consider the previous block coordinate descent approach, which at iteration T produces an estimate X hat T, given an input burst of uh, low resolution frames. And if we see this estimate 
after t, after t steps as a sequence of operations that may be differentiable, we can simply use backpropagation and train the model parameters to minimize the reconstruction loss. For example, here, assuming that now we have training data, pairs of high quality color images Xi and robust Yi, we can simply minimize the loss such that we estimates match the, the ground truth data. So this is now a, a, just a very basic view of our method. Uh, our, our method. We can see it as, a, uh, as an architecture that can be coded in PyTorch or TensorFlow or whatever deep learning framework that does steps that are interpretable. It will alternate between estimation data fitting, basically optimizing with respect to Z, denoising by using a convnet, and Lucas can add steps that will refine the motion estimation between the different frames. So it has some interpretability. And now we benefit from a data-driven image prior because we are going to learn the weights of the CNN in a supervised fashion. So I already showed you some results about this, uh, this approach. Let me show you uh, now something not very realistic, but a bit extreme just to see what these types of approach can produce. So here in the next experiment, we consider RGB images, not raw images. And we generate a burst of low resolution uh, frames of uh, 20 frames with random affine motions that we don't know at this time. So we apply your method, which has this uh, classical point of this uh, point of view of classical inverse problems. And this is the types of results that we can get if we simply ask the, to increase the resolution by 16. So it's not something you are going to be able to do in the real life. But I think it's still interesting to see as a proof of concept what we can get. Now, the first results in the presentations were obtained using real data, using a Panasonic camera, which did not have, by the way, an anti-aliasing filter. We tried it on several other types of cameras, also on smartphones. And here, the next result is obtained using a Pixel 4a camera. So on the left, we have the picture that was taken in the street without you know, using just default setting for the camera. And we are going to zoom on this very tiny red square. If we do that in the middle, this is what the smartphone produces. But if we take a burst and you are able to process the data which is contained in the burst on the right, this is what we obtain. So the next example I like it very much, it's also a picture that was taken using the Pixel 4a camera. The small red square is very, very tiny. And what I like in this picture is that we have some elements with very high frequencies and we clearly see some aliasing artifacts. In the middle, you see this uh, blue and orange uh, artifacts. And on the right, this is what we recover by processing a burst of 30 frames. So we are relatively excited about these types of results because um, it's, uh, it's basically working in the real life. Now, of course, there are some failure cases. And the most important one is that so far, we assume that the scenes are static. That means that if there is a moving object, we are going to have a mismatch between the model and the way the data is produced. And for example, on the bottom right, uh, we have a guy running and there, there is a ghosting artifact simply because the images are not well aligned. We use simply an affine motion model, which is not realistic for these uh, types of scenes. So it's a bit hard to see probably on Zoom, but on, these are on the left other types of artifacts that will appear when there is some mismatch with, uh, uh, between the model and the data. So as a take home message, uh, there are several ones. Well, there is one which is that 40 years old computer vision algorithms are useful. You should be convinced about that if you are using ConvNet, by the way. One which is well known in signal processing is that aliasing can be good, if we deal with multiple frames. And uh, something, and I'm not the only ones to say that, is that classical approaches are robust and interpretable, and they greatly benefit from deep learning principles, which are here differentiable programming. And I will now stop here, and uh, be, I will be happy to answer any question. OK, thank you very much for the great talk. Um, do we have any questions?
So it seems so far there are no questions on YouTube. Um, maybe let me ask a quick question. What, what do you think will be required to also handle dynamic scenes in contrast to, to only static scenes? What, what do you think what machinery will be necessary to, to um, successfully deal with these cases? So it's a good question. So we are, so uh, at some point we need to have, uh, I mean, it would simply mean that we need to have an optical, I mean, to model the optical flow in the scene. And uh, what is the right machinery uh, it's something that we are currently investigating. Mm. One of the difficulties that we, we really need to align with uh, sub-pixel accuracy. And uh, if we simply use an optical flow solver as a black box, it's probably not going to work immediately. But we are working on it and it's, uh, it will be a challenging task uh, indeed to do that. Okay. Let's have a last final question, a sh short question by Klaus Müller. Yeah, so I, I'm wondering, um, very nice talk and impressive results. So I'm wondering um, whether, you know, if you think about video coding, then that you could, I mean, video coding tries to compress the, the movements and it has some information on how these movements are. So the question is whether this could be used for, for your purpose in order to get rid of ghosts. So, so basically, if we... I mean, it's a bit of chicken and egg problem because if we are able to model right the motion, we will be able also to improve the, the coding part. Now, something I should mention as well is that this problem is actually different from video super resolution. And the reason is that we are dealing with raw frames. And typically in, in videos, we are already working with the output of uh, the device of the camera. Uh, and the problem is actually of a quite of a different nature. So the alignment, I agree, can be useful. You know, the, the motion, if it is well, if we have a perfect idea about the motion in the scene, then we can apply your method. Uh, but dealing with uh, videos, it's actually a slightly different problem because of this, uh, the fact that we deal, we deal with raw images, raw data. Thank you. Okay, in consideration of time, let's move on to the last speaker of the session who will be Daniel Kremers. Thank you, Florian, for uh, chairing the session. It's my pleasure to be here as well. Um, I want to talk about Visual Slam in the age of self-supervised learning. Um, and this is trying to combine uh, research in uh, simultaneous localization and mapping with recent developments in deep learning. Uh, the work that I'm presenting has been done mostly by uh, current and former students of mine, in particular Nan, Lucas, Rui, and Jacob. Visual Slam is a classical problem. It, uh, it has a long history, uh, in fact, more than 100 years, which for computer vision is very long. And so back in the days, there were uh, applied mathematicians like Krupa who uh, proved theorems of the type that if you observe uh, five uh, corresponding points in two images, you can actually recover the relative motion of the camera and the 3D location of these points. And whereas originally this was done on aerial images and manually in the 70s, 80s and 90s, the computer vision community set out to deploy computers to actually do these reconstructions. And they followed very closely in Kropa's footsteps and uh, developed quite impressive techniques and some of the first real-time capable visual slam techniques uh, emerged around 2000. This is just a few representative works in this field. And uh, what's important though, is that most of these approaches actually do follow very closely in Krupa's footsteps. That means they start with two images because Krupa said we, have, we assume two images. They extract points because Krupa said we want points. Uh, and then they need to identify correspondences because Krupa said we need corresponding point pairs. And once you have corresponding point pairs, you can run uh, algorithms such as bundle adjustment to uh, that minimize this reprojection error to compute 3D structure and camera motion. And uh, this is a very sophisticated pipeline by now. Um, nevertheless, I think it's always uh, important to question e even the pioneers. 
and I would argue Krupa may have been very pioneering, but I think to, to real-time slam and real-time structure from motion, he may have also been quite misleading. The reason is the following. Uh, when, when you uh, get, uh, take a camera nowadays and you switch it on, you don't see points, you see colors or brightness values. And in particular, you don't have corresponding points. And we all know that estimating correspondence is one of the most challenging and nasty problems in vision. And in some sense, any, any error you make in that uh, first abstraction step of points and corresponding points, those errors are gonna propagate and deteriorate your solution, right? And you can typically not recover un unless you add heuristics such as ransack to resample the correspondences, etc. And so I think it's time to revisit this paradigm and see, can we not get directly from the uh, sensory measurements to a uh, 3D reconstruction in terms of camera motion and 3D structure? And this is an approach that we uh, advocate and we refer to as direct because it goes straight from the sensory data to your estimates. And I think anyone who works in sensor analysis, let's say if you work in a Bayesian framework, et cetera, you will agree that the closer you stick to your sensory measurements, the more likely you will actually achieve optimal solutions, right? See getting the best reconstruction, the best camera motion given what given your sensory data. But the key difference between what we call these classical key point based methods on the, on the left and the direct methods on the right is that the key point methods minimize a geometric reprojection error like in bundle adjustment, whereas the direct methods minimize a photometric color consistency error. So you're basically saying find a camera motion and a 3D world such that when I project my, my points into 3D and back out into the other images, I should get consistency. So it is that brightness consistency that drives everything, much like in optical flow uh, that served as inspiration. Here. But more specifically, let's look at one of these approaches, a technique we called LSD SLAM for large scale direct SLAM. It's a somewhat sophisticated approach. It starts on the top left with uh, the input uh, video stream, and then there's a tracking and a mapping component that uh, run in alternation. And if we look at this tracking component here that tracks the rigid body motion of the camera, here you see the brightness consistency as a loss function. So we have a keyframe, we have a current frame, and we basically try to align the current frame to the keyframe in terms of the brightness consistency. And so all the pixels X contribute here to that measure of brightness consistency. But since we only estimate the six parameters of the rigid body motion G Xi, uh, this can be easily done in a course to find a hierarchical scheme uh, um, uh, on a single core of a CPU in, in real time. So this is very fast to compute. And so we can use a simple CPU even on a laptop here uh, and we can track the camera in real time as you see here. And on the right, you see the track camera and the 3D structure of the world emerging. We called it LSD SLAM for large scale direct SLAM because among real time capable visual SLAM methods, it was one of the first that uh, allowed to really reconstruct as you see here, fairly large environments with almost no distortion. And in fact, this challenge has driven us a lot over the last years. How do we minimize the drift? Here's a follow-up work called direct sparse odometry, where we actually more jointly estimate camera motion and 3D structure in a Gauss-Newton optimization uh, framework. And top left, you see the images, uh, you see the method, it runs in real time and uh, tracks the camera motion at very high precision and maps the environment in real time. And as you can see, we can walk through the subway station. And of course, there's going to be errors in the camera pose that will accumulate over thousands of frames. But what is this total error here, the drift? You see the bicycle on the top left is actually reconstructed twice. Uh, and the drift here is what, two meters, maybe two or three meters on a distance of hundreds of meters of walking. So you could say the drift is less than, say, 1%. But how do we quantify this? So here's how we went about this. One of the biggest challenges, especially in the deep learning age nowadays, is how do we get ground truth? How do we quantify performance of methods? 
we took the camera outside, we recorded and inside all sorts of different lenses, different cameras, different motions, different environments. They're very different sequences, but they all have one thing in common. They all loop back to where we started from. And that allows us to compute a total drift per sequence. And this is what we plot here in this kind of statistical quantitative evaluation and compare to what was considered the state of the art in key point based methods in uh, orb slam, a very powerful and popular technique from a team in Zaragoza. What you see here is plotted is the, the, the translational, the rotational and the scale error always. Uh, and on the y axis, the number of sequences where we achieve that error. So ultimately, you want to be in the top left corner. Dashed is the real time method, uh, solid line at the time 2017 or so. Solid is if you have a bit more compute time, you get a slightly higher precision. And you can read these plots in many ways. For example, you can say, what is the best, the, the precision on the best 300 runs here? Orb Slam has a precision of six and uh, DSO has a precision of an error of one. So the error is reduced by almost an order of magnitude here. So this is a quite dramatic improvement that I believe comes from modeling the raw sensory data and going straight to, to the estimates of, of 3D structure and camera motion. Or you can say if you want robustness, let's say in an application you want to impose maximum error of two, how many sequences of the 500 can we track with that error? Whereas the state of the art can track 100, we can track 400 of the 500 sequences. So a dramatic boost in robustness as well. Now the key question is how can I further boost the precision of such systems with the deep networks? And we've seen over the last years, uh, deep nets had a huge impact in virtually all areas of computer vision and beyond. But 3D reconstruction Thomas Brooks talked about it, remains, I think, one of the challenging areas. There has been quite a number of uh, approaches that employ deep networks for visual slam or structure for motion, as it used to be called. But unfortunately, a lot of these techniques, when it comes to precision of camera tracking, do not achieve state of the art performance. They show you can use deep nets, you can train them to do this task, but they don't seem to perform very well compared to what we had before. I don't you know, want to go too much into detail why that is, but what we've been advocating somehow is how can we combine the best of the both worlds? Because if you do an end-to-end -end training of a deep network, you lose a lot of the knowledge about how cameras move, about the perspective projection into images that, that you know, right? But there is a lot you can do with deep networks. For example, it turns out you can train a network to just given a single image, predict the depths of the scene. Um, and that is quite impressive, but not surprising because even we as humans, if we see photographs like that, we can estimate how far things are from the camera. Turns out we can further improve the precision of these networks. This is uh, Nan Yang's work from 2018. So we get fairly accurate depth predictions for single images, for keyframes, if you will. Now we can feed these predictions into our SLAM approach. Uh, as a, in, a, in terms of a loss function that we add to the SLAM approach where we say find a reconstruction that is maximally consistent with these depth predictions. And once we do that, uh, this is what we get. So what you see here now is a reconstruction from just one single moving camera. So it's not using stereo, it's not using inertial, it's not using GPS, it just uses the bottom left video to reconstruct, as you can see, the world uh, on a very large scale. And it's essentially drift free. So even if you drive around the block, as you see here, there's practically no drift, especially compared to the standard monocular approach. In particular, we actually get scaled reconstructions of the world. We get the metric scale. Why? Because the depth predictions are in metric scale. Here's a comparison to state-of-the-art stereo methods, and it turns out this proposed deep learning enhanced method outperforms uh, the, you know, some of the state-of-the-art stereo-based methods, even though it uses only one single camera. 
And so in some sense, the message here is that by feeding in predictions from a deep network, we can compensate for missing sensory information. Turns out we can go further. This is from last year, D3VO, so deep depths, deep pose, and deep uncertainty. We can not only predict depths, but uh, something that was earlier also shown in Thomas Brock's lab, you can estimate with deep networks, uh, you can train them to predict the relative motion of the camera given two consecutive frames. And we can predict some notion of uncertainty. Let me go into more detail. So, you know, I said, Color consistency is what drives everything. What we are doing now really is we can, we deploy in deep networks to help us understand how colors really vary from one image to the other, right? These are things we can try to manually model, but we can also try to use deep networks to learn that from examples. Typically, for example, brightness is not preserved, right? If you take two consecutive images, you have aperture changes. And so you can actually model an affine uh, brightness transformation to align the two images. And you can train a deep network given the two images to predict that affine transformation that aligns them in terms of brightness. But even then, if you go to the real world, you have structures here in the real world, you know, metallic structures, glass windows, where brightness will not be preserved no matter what you align, right? So then we can train a deep network to predict what's often called aleatoric uncertainty. So it can tell us where in the image does it think brightness will or will not be preserved. And we can simply downweight these loss functions here that use this color consistency in a self-supervised manner to, to downweight those areas where brightness is likely not preserved. And it turns out that works really well and actually generalizes to different data sets. <clears throat> Now we fuse all of these predictions, as I said, into the loss function uh, um, to make sure everything is consistent. Uh, and then we can look at how uh, good are we in terms of predicting the depths. And it turns out here's a comparison to, uh, to different methi methods on Kitty and on Eurog. And we show compared to the state of the art mono depths too, we get a significant improvement in, in depth prediction. And what's nice is this generalizes to other data sets. So we train on say Kitty here and we deploy it in the cityscapes data set and both the depth prediction, but also this uncertainty prediction works fairly reliably to tell us here we expect in the windows, for example, the brightness will not be preserved. Now coming back to estimating the camera precision, the, the, the odometry is often called, here is a comparison to classical and to deep learning based methods and it shows that we can do better than state of the art stereo methods again. But even more, we can compare to state-of-the-art stereo inertial methods, and we show that this monocular method is on par with the leading stereo inertial methods, even though it uses only one single camera. So this is how you can boost the precision of SLAM methods with deep networks. Of course, you can do much more with deep networks. This is work supported by the company Artisans that I co-founded. They, de they develop multi-sensor systems that they uh, can deploy in, in a whole fleet of cars here in a project in Berlin. Um, and you can see we can get semantic reconstructions where we can label drivable area, sidewalk, cars, pedestrians, etc. And we can, in, in pretty much no time with very low cost hardware, create large scale semantic 3D maps of the world we live in. And I think this is very valuable for autonomous driving to have maps uh, and semantics. And going further, we can use uh, multiple uh, consecutive images and train networks to predict dense, detailed maps of the world, as this one, computed from only one single moving camera. And I think this is again important because you see we're now at a level where we can really drop the LiDAR from the self-driving cars because with just one camera, we can get extremely dense and detailed colored reconstructions of the world, right? And this, I think, is a perfect test bed for training uh, self-driving cars, for example, because you can simply create copies of the 3D world just by driving through them with a single camera. That's all I wanted to talk to about. 
Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the nice presentation, Daniel. So I think there's a bit of time for questions. So there's one a question from YouTube. Are there any approaches, experiments, or results performed of time invariant visual slam, for example, using similar as with super point or super clue for day night points matching? Uh, that's a complex question. Time invariant slam, day night. Um, le let me try to address some of some of the topics in in the question. Um, so yes, one of the key challenges that uh, Artisans has been focusing on a lot is extending the performance of these methods to corner cases. And this is often when you take something from the research lab and try to deploy it in, in the real world, one of the biggest challenges is to make sure that the, the corner cases get eliminated, that you can guarantee performance even in low light conditions, in rain, in snow, in the dark, etc. And this, to some extent, uh, there is a, a challenge in, in tweaking the algorithms to work reliably, but there's a, a lot we can do. Uh, and, and we found a dramatic boost in performance by deploying deep networks to help us understand the color and brightness variations and how, how they vary with the seasons, with the lighting, et cetera. And so we've shown that there is a, a technique called a GN net, we call it Gauss Newton net, that allows us to cope with quite significant variations in, in color, brightness, with low light conditions, with rain and snow, etc. Okay, thank you. Um, I think in consideration of time, we should um, close this session. And I would like to thank everyone for attending. Now we will have our lunch break, which will be roughly one hour, and we will reconvene at 1.30 with Eric Moulin's talk. See you later. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone, to the French German Machine Learning Symposium. My name is Nicolas Demmel, and I will be chairing this session. I'm very happy to announce our first speaker, Eric Moulin, will be talking on non equilibrium sampling. Eric, please take it away. Thanks a lot. Okay, so it's a joint work with Achille Tain, who is a PhD student of mine. So I co advise a student with Arnaud Doucet, who is a professor at the uh, University of Oxford and also a worker at DeepMind, so working in DeepMind in London, and myself. So there are also a contribution from others uh, in this talk. Okay. So just a brief uh, recap of what I'm doing. So, so what, what I'm trying to pretend today is that there are many problems in machine learning and artificial intelligence that involve the inference of probability distribution. And in many cases, I've explained why is this the probability distribution are known to a normalizing constant. Uh, so of course, the problem is not new. So it's at the core of uh, many, many uh, developments in particular, and uh, it was a, it's a main problem in Bayesian inference and in particular for uncertainty quantification. So I'm working on this topic, but I will ex not explain much in this area. And, and now it appears also in generative models, in particular in rational autoencoders, I will explain why generative adversarial networks, so is, Gerard Bio will speak about that. And also there are other issues which are of interest, like missing data, which I will not speak about that. Uh, okay, so each of these problems comes with the, its own flavors, but uh, all these problems involve basically the problem of sampling, so the ability of produce samples from complex probability distribution. So the second problem is the uh, problem of computation of normalizing constants, so it, which is called for, for example, in Bayesian inference, it will be called evidence, and it would be interesting when, when you are willing to compare, for example, from Bayesian point of view, different models in, 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 in other domain, like in statistical physics, it's called free energy computation, which are very important. And of course, for Bayesian inference, you have also to compute posterior means. So today, we focus on working more or less on all of these topics for quite a okay, for 30 years now. But uh, today, we focus on generative models. So, so what is a generative model? So, uh, so generative, there are many, many sorts of generative models, but uh, so there, there have been a, a considerable interest right now, which have been more or less triggered by the early work of uh, among many others, I would say, by uh, Max Wedding and his student, Kingma, and uh, also uh, Resendez, and, uh, and there are many, many people which are working on this area now. And what is a generative uh, uh, model? So I would mostly consider in this talk the, the deep latent growth model, but there are many, many different types of uh, generative models. So, so what are the assumptions? So, so basically, in all this model, you have a latent space, which is uh, typically of low dimension comp compared to the high dimension of the observation. And this atom space can have a simple structure. So it's not so true that right now, if you look at the last generation of uh, VQVIE, for example, where the latent space has very complex structure, but in, in deep latent Gaussian models, it has a very simple structure. And the complexity comes from feeding this uh, low dimensional, uh, simple latent variable into a deep neural net. In the, and then adding at the output of the network some some noise. Okay, so it's uh, if you want to, to see how it works. So you have a, a latent space. So typically in the in the first version, particularly in Kigma, you you, you draw there basically a Gaussian random variable. So it's uh, in our RP, P can be sort of for the hundred something like that. Then you feed this into uh, your favorite uh, deep net, can be a ConvNet or a, ResNet or whatever you wish. And then at the output of this, you have an output and then you add noise or you feed this output within, within as a parameter of an exponential distribution. And then you generate the desired object. There are many, many um, examples, different associations. This, this is a basic one. Of course, uh, there are many parameters to, to fit in this type of model and because uh, so uh, deep latent by Gaussian model uh, fit in, in, into a problem of where the likelihood itself is not uh, explicit of, because the likelihood is, is a marginal likelihood. The thing which is easy to compute is a marginal likelihood, uh, which is uh, you integrate, you marginalize the likelihood with respect to the latent variable Z. So which means that you can uh, formulate the estimation problem as a maximum likelihood problem, but you formulate this problem with a, a likelihood function, which is non, uh, of course, uh, 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 it has an analytic form, but this analytic form is an integral. And remember that even if the latent space is for low dimensional, 
the, the, the number of variables to integrate is sort of, of unders. So, so which means that the margin of likelihood is intractable. So which is a problem which is rather classical in computational statistics. We call that uh, intractable uh, priors, for example, in Bayesian uh, estimation. And, and, and also another problem which is of interest for us, and we change a bit the, the, the type of uh, techniques that we can use, is that the number of parameters D, which are, for example, the, 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 the weights in the deep net is very large. So it can be of order of millions or even more. And of course, uh, uh, because you have many, many uh, parameters to fit, the number, number of observation is also very large. So what is a classical approach to, to do this? Because this problem is not new. As I said, in computational statistics, the problem is not new. And what was a classical approach in computational statistics was to do something like, uh, which can be, looks like a bit like a gradient descent, but a gradient descent with a special flavor in the sense that you cannot really compute the gradient of the criterion with here the, the likelihood. So the negated likelihood, because if you do descent, you pay to minus. And, uh, but of course, there is a very uh, famous formula. Sometimes it's called a Fisher uh, formula in which you can prove, and it's a very easy, it's a free line computation, that the gradient of the like of the uh, incomplete likelihood or the marginal likelihood can be obtained as the expectation of the gradient of the complete data likelihood, which is integrated with respect to the posterior distribution of uh, the latent variable given the observation. Okay, so th this has been the the, the, the working horse of uh, many, many uh, uh, models. And uh, where what you typically do in this type of stuff is that you, 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 do, uh, you, you approximate, uh, you compute uh, the parameter by, by doing something like gradient descent, and then, but, and you approximate the gradient by running in parallel uh, a, a Markov chain Monte Carlo method to approximate, to draw samples according to this uh, posterior distribution. Okay, this, this was most or less the state of the art at the beginning, uh, ten, to say 10 years ago. Uh, I did a lot in this, in this area using either uh, gradient descent or uh, EM type algorithm. So in EM type algorithm, this is called, for example, stochastic approximation EM or something like that. So there are many uh, algorithms of that sort. So what is the preferred form in uh, in, in, uh, in machine learning today? So of course, because of the dimension of the latent space and the fact that you have a, 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 a super large number of observation, which means that you have to approximate not a single, you don't have to approximate a single posterior distribution, but you have to approximate many posterior distribution. But one, one, one type of method which has been used is to use a variational approximation. So what is a variational approximation is that you, you, fact you, you postulate a form for the family of distribution, which depends upon other parameters, which are collected, which are denoted by phi, and uh, of course you cannot really uh, you cannot really uh, compute the likelihood function. So, but you you can compute easily a lower bound, so which is called an evidence lower bound, elbow, and this uh, lower bound, in fact, is a is a is a is a lower bound of the of the objective, which is the likelihood, and this lower bound is obtained. Uh, like this, so you compute simply the callback labeler uh, divergence between the joint uh, distribution of the observation and the latent uh, and Q5. So remember that this quantity, uh, the joint distribution of P theta Y Z, in fact, is not is not working on the same space. So what you have, you have to to subtract the uh, you have to subtract the uh, P theta of P, P theta of Y, which is a marginal likelihood, or and then you have the term which is a KL. This is why, in fact, the elbow is a lower term. So of course you can you can obtain uh, uh, elbows and so I, I worked also on this topic if you get interested in order to the way you you can produce better elbows. So I will if I have time I will explain how you you can try to obtain better elbows than the sim simple ones. The so other so so if you look at this uh, when you lose that what is variational uh, inference for DGM so you 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 get you you start with uh, a family of variational. Uh, uh, a rational family of distribution, which is called sometimes the encoder. So the encoder is called amortized, so in, in the sense that it depends upon the observation through, in fact, uh, also another neural net, so which encodes really. So it's so you start from the observation wise, and you 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 feed this observation into a neural net. This neural net produces parameters for. Uh, 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 latent variables. So for example, it can be a Gaussian with uh, some mean and some variance, but this mean and this variance depends upon the input. So this is called the encoder. 
And then you, you just learn uh, jointly the decoder, so with the parameter of the decoder, theta, and the parameter of the encoder by uh, optimize, minimizing the uh, elbow, maximizing the elbow. Another method is to, to use generative adversarial network. In, in such case, of course, what you do, so you, so you use basically the same generator, but you train them in a completely different way. So it's not about, the, it's basically some structure to generate observation. The way it is trained, the way it is trained is different. is completely different because in, in GANs you use zero sum games, so it's a, so you use a, a discriminator and a, and once you have the discriminator, what you know is that the optimal discriminator is given by this formula. So it's basically the base uh, formula. So and then you can you can say okay, so if I have the distribution p theta of y, which is the distribution of generator, and if I know also the discriminator. And then if I assume that everything has well converged, so which means that the discriminator is really given by uh, the base rule. So then I, I have a better estimate of the true distribution in this form, okay, where d theta is a log it of the discriminator. So which means that th th there is a family of method called MCMC GAN, where you once you have more or less obtained a GAN, then you can try to sample this GAN with most likely if everything goes well, should have better, it's a better approximation of P. Okay, so if uh, in all of the setting, of course, what you have is that you have a, a, a distribution pi of dx, this distribution is known, it depends upon the prior, and then you have a likelihood term, so and, and a normalizing term, which is Z. So in the Bayesian setting, the prior distribution, rho is the prior distribution, L is the likelihood, in generative adversarial network, rho is a generator distribution and L is derived, it's a log it of the discriminator. In rational autoencoder, it's a bit more, more subtle in the sense that you have a Y which comes into play, so which means that in this time you have the, the times of the prior, is a, not denoted with a PDF there, times the likelihood becomes a joint distribution of X and Y, so that's a, the joint likelihood, and Z, which is uh, Normalizing constant is a marginal likelihood, and so what what we you need to do when you do uh, to formulate an elbow is to be able to obtain a uh, lower bound for uh, log of z. Okay, so what are the objectives then? Is to construct an unbiased estimator of the normalizing constant z, which is equal to lx or dx, and to sample from pi. Okay, the classical technique to do this is uh, to use MCMC, but MCMC has their, have their problems, and so, so I, I basically use a different method, and this is uh, the purpose of my talk today. Uh, so, uh, so my method is based on important sampling IDs. So important sampling IDs, uh, like one, one of the most simple IDs in, is important sampling to compute this type of quantity. So when you do important sampling, what you do is that you take a distribution rho, say for example rho, you sample id from rho, and then you estimate the normalizing constant by averaging the estimate of xi, and you weight by the inverse of the number of uh, samples. So it's clear that uh, such estimator that that is an unbiased one. And what you can do typically to improve if you reach this estimator is to use a mapping. And so imagine that the mapping is uh, becomes uh, invariant with respect to uh, that, the, that the distribution rho is invariant with respect to this mapping. So which means that the push forward of rho by t is equal to rho. Then what you can do is that you simply, so you, you sample from rho, then you compute trajectory according to uh, t. So you compute the orbit of the mapping, and then you obtain an estimate by averaging not on xi, but you average with weights. Of course, you average with weights uh, the orbits of the xi uh, according to the mapping. And what you can expect is that you obtain a, a smaller variance estimate uh, than the crude IS estimator, provided that the mapping is well uh, chosen. Okay. So of course, what we will do today is that, in fact, uh, so of course, if you if you assume that t should be invariant for rho, so this is a bit annoying. So what I prefer to have is I prefer to have an a more general class of estimator. So I, I I will I can show. So it's a very it's very easy. So perhaps we don't have time to go through all the proof. But uh, I, what I can do, I can extend this to any mapping. So so typically, I will denote rho k which is a push forward of rho this time by the transformation TK. So G is, uh, is a Jacobian determinant. And then you use, uh, and what you do is that you define what is like a generalized uh, proposal distribution, which is a com combination. It's a mixture, of course, of this uh, push forward of rho by the mapping TK. 
and you use a key identity, which is identity be, be behind the uh, important sampling estimates, where you see that fx rho x is equal simply to fx rho x divided by rho t multiplied by rho t. And because you have this uh, a very simple expression, you can re rewrite this as a kind of integral with respect to rho with weight wk, which can be expressed like this. Okay, so it's a very simple algebra. And then you obtain uh, you obtain an estimator where you have to reweight. So it's there is an expression for weights. You have to reweight. In fact, you draw from rho, you compute the orbit of uh, this the point draw from rho according to t, and then you compute weights according to this formula, which is very explicit. Okay, this estimator might also be seen as a kind of uh, specific application of multiple important sampling. Okay, so what you can do with this, you can you can do, for example, you obtain an estimator of the uh, normalizing constant. So this time you take uh, for f, you take uh, the likelihood function. This is an important this is an important sampling estimator for z, which is unbiased, so it's completely trivial there. And uh, uh, the, the the choice of t now is of course is very important. And uh, so the idea that we had, of course, which is, seems to be very natural, is to, to choose t in order to drive sample from rho to the set where the likelihood is large. And also because you have to compute, you remember that you have to compute the Jacobian. Of course, this is uh, very important to, to have transform t for which the Jacobian is easy to compute. So you have, you have uh, many normalizing flows. So there is a huge literature about uh, how to construct the such flow with neural nets also, which, which is, uh, we don't uh, do in the, go in that direction. We have work in this direction, of course. There are many, many, very nice work on flows and uh, we, which has really changed uh, the way people look at important sampling. Important sampling today combined with flow can be very efficient because you can, have very, you can produce with simple distribution and complex flow, you can you can really build very flexible distribution. But what I use today is, in fact, is uh, a, a, something which is more classical, which is a conformal Hamiltonian transform. What is a conformal Hamiltonian transform? So it's a, it's a, it's a, in a, it's an Hamiltonian method in which you, you what you do is that you define a potential energy, so which is LQ rho Q. Okay, so you take the log because it's an energy function. You define a kinetic energy, which is simply the uh, with p, which is a mass, so now now x is becomes q, and p is a kind of uh, additional variable, and you define what is called the Hamiltonian, which is a sum of the potential energy and the kinetic energy, and uh, you define a, con a, a conformal Hamiltonian system in which you what you do is that you 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 have an Hamiltonian ODE, so an Hamiltonian ODE, which is like an Hamiltonian ODE, but it's conformal in the sense that you have a friction term. What you can prove, which is very easy, in fact, is that for any solution of this. Uh, a conformal Hamiltonian ODE, in fact, converges in the sense that you have the system is dissipative because you have a dissipative term here. You have a friction term, so it's dissipative. It dissipates exactly a, a, a quantity which is gamma times the, the kinetic energy. So, which means that the, the only stationary points of this distribution are fixed points, which are Q star and P star, where the, 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 the particle goes, the, the, the momentum of the particle goes to zero. And in fact, Q star becomes it's a local minima of uh, the energy. Okay, you can do uh, Euler discretization for that. So this is a conformal vector field. Okay, you can do conformal vector field with this. So it's like if you it depends upon the choice of gamma. So if you choose if you have gamma equals zero, no friction, you have Hamiltonian trajectory. And if you use gamma which increase gamma like this, you obtain trajectory which converges to points. Okay, so message. In fact, it works very very well. In the sense that you, uh, if you are here, this, this, this have, I have many, many more works on that, but if, if, even in a simple case, so well, it's really this uh, called, it's called infine, and it's really, it, it works much better than important sampling and in important sampling, which are considered, and in important sampling is really considered as a state of the art for likelihood estimation, and, and infinite works really much better in, on many, uh, uh, it also works well. In the multimodal case, and this is basically you have a very strong exploration uh, um, property of this model because you use sample point and then you optimize. So it's a, it's a very good strategy for doing this. Uh, the good news also, but I have only one minute, so I will uh, conclude there. So the good news is that you can combine this to do to perform uh, sampling, and exactly, and you have and the, the, also the good news. So I have many many things to do, so it's uh, more like one hour would not be enough, I think. The other good news is that we can also uh, define uh, variational autoencoders with this method. And to do variational autoencoders with this method, in fact, is that we, can, we might define a new uh, elbow with this uh, uh, 
estimator, unbiased estimator of the uh, uh, of the uh, normalizing constant. So we obtain a, a, a new elbow, uh, which which may be defined as a as a uh, as a, as it's an elbow, so you can we can it's again an extended elbow, so it's it's something like that. So I would just so conclude with uh, with examples where we get uh, examples uh, from this elbow, which shows that we are doing very well. So if you look at these numbers, we are doing very well compared uh, with uh, class state of the art, which is uh, uh, IWEIE, so which is one of the state of the art for this type of model. So in fact, it's a model which is very simple, which is a, a DLGM uh, model. Okay, so I have many, many more to say, but I think it's, it's enough for today. Thanks a lot. Question. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, in the interest of time, unfortunately, I think we don't have time for questions right now. Too bad. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this interesting talk. And uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, which is Laura Leal Taché from Munich. And she'll be talking on deep metric learning. Okay, thank you, Nico, for the introduction. Um, so indeed, today I want to present our latest work on deep metric learning together with uh, Jenny and Ismail. And so let me start by briefly introducing what is deep metric learning. Um, so in this task, we want to learn a distance function among objects. So for example, if we would have these two pictures with objects A and B, um, the network unfortunately would say, or would be trained to say, um, that these two images indeed don't look similar and therefore their distance should be large. And especially compared with these two images which belong to the same person, it should say that there is a high similarity and therefore a small distance. Now, um, while the training is um, a bit complex and indeed we will go um, today through how to train this efficiently, um, the testing is actually very simple and very powerful. So with a simple thresholding, for example, uh, computed the distance between these two images and just saying, if this distance is above a threshold, we can determine that this is not the same person. While if the distance is below a threshold, we can determine that this is the same person. So with this distance function, we can also um, cluster different objects uh, and obtain such a representation in which you see here um, different clusters, in this case of uh, species of birds. So you can see that, for example, these birds with the red head are all clustered together, while if we observe another cluster, we see all these birds which are sort of brownish. And um, apparently this is the same, the same species of birds. I, I cannot really um, tell one from the other. Uh, but it actually works really, really well, even for tiny differences. Um, now, the tricky thing about, about deep metric learning is actually how to train the network for such a task. So usually we train it with a contrastive or triplet loss. In the simplest contrastive loss, we use um, one comparison. So we either compare two images, an anchor and a positive sample, which are supposed to depict the same object. And our goal is to bring the distance between these two objects closer together. While at the same time, if we see an image of um, this bike with, um, compared with another sample, which is, should be a negative sample, so in this case, another type of bike, the distance between these two images should be pulled further and further apart. And this is how we create our loss function. Now, a stronger loss function is the triplet loss, which uses relationships, so one between the anchor and the positive and the other between the anchor and a negative image. And in this case, the only thing that we need um, to preserve in our loss function is that the distance between anchor and positive is smaller than the distance between anchor and negative. So we don't care about the absolute value of this distance. And this actually allows us to um, train this distance function, so to pull the similar objects together and different objects apart. Now, the thing is that um, in order to train these models, we need to choose these pairs or triplets. And it turns out that in the huge data sets that we're usually dealing with, there are indeed a lot of pairs and a lot of triplets, 
but most of them are really uninformative. So for example, this pair or this triplet where we're comparing a bike with a chair, it's very, very easy for the network to say that the chair is indeed not the same as the bike. And therefore it's very possible that within a couple of iterations, the network is already learning nothing from this triplet. So usually um, what researchers have done is spend quite a lot of time in um, developing special sampling techniques in order to obtain really informative triplets to really define these decision boundaries in a finer and finer way. Now, what we would like to do ideally is to take at least a batch of images and use all the relations in this batch. So not um, B have relations, which is what you do with the contrastive loss, or two B third relations, which is what you do with the triplet loss, but really all the possible comparisons of samples that you have within the batch. So the question that we need to answer today is, could we actually take the global batch structure into account when training our neural network for deep metric learning? So for this, um, we have proposed to leverage all intra-batch connections in our um, recently accepted ICML paper. And so how we start is um, like most deep metric learning uh, methods, we start with a feature initialization, which means that we encode every image of our batch uh, with a convolutional neural network. And so now each image is represented by this embedding. And so in the second step, what we propose to do is um, to create a graph where each sample of our batch is going to be a node. And this node is going to be represented with a feature embedding, which represents this sample. And now what's going to happen in this graph is um, a series of what we call message passing steps. So this is indeed a message passing network. And what happens in here is that the samples communicate with each other. So they look at each other's embedding, they look at how similar, dissimilar they are, and they update their own embeddings based on the neighborhood. And this is what I'm going to go into detail um, in a few slides. Now, the cool thing is that once we have extracted the embedding and we have done this communication step in the graph, now we can train our network, both the uh, message passing network as well as the convolutional neural network, we can train it all in an end-to-end -end fashion with a classification loss. So there is no contrastive loss, there is no triplet loss, we simply train this for the task of classification. And as we will see, since the comparison is already happening in the message passing network, a classification loss is enough to actually um, learn this distance function. So now the main question is, what is the message passing network doing? So the goal of the message passing network is to refine the initial embeddings, right? So the embeddings coming from the CNN by taking into account the relations between all samples in the batch. So imagine that I'm this image of this car and I'm represented by this embedding. Now what happens in this step is I look at all the other images, all the other cars, in the batch, and I start comparing all of them with myself. And I see which ones are similar, I see which ones are dissimilar, and I update my embedding based on that. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking into account all the other images so that I can make a proper um, classification, I can have a proper classification output at the end of the day when I train with a cross entropy loss. So um, let me go a little bit in more detail on how these message passing networks work. So essentially we need to start with a graph initialization. Um, we have nodes and edges and we have optionally feature embeddings for the nodes and the edges. In our case, only for the nodes. But the interesting part, the learning part happens here in the middle where there's this information propagation step across the graph and across several iterations. So an iteration is when a node gathers information from the neighboring nodes and updates its own embedding. And this happens for several steps, which we can consider as several hidden layers. 
And in the end, what we're going to have is the same graph, the same connectivity, but with nodes that have updated features, right? So now the feature embeddings somehow contain this, this context, this information from the neighbors. And the more propagation steps you do, the more information you get from further and further away neighbors. Um, so in particular, how we do this in our work is um, we take, in order to update uh, a node embedding, let's say of node I, we take all the embeddings of the neighboring nodes and we're going to aggregate them. So note that um, in here we have a summation and it has, um, so this operation has to be an operation that works for any number of nodes, because of course you don't know the connectivity a priori. And this aggregation is going to happen with um, these learned weights, right? These are the weights that you actually train when you perform backpropagation. Now, furthermore, we have attention scores in order to give different importance to different neighbors. And it's important to note that the weight is actually the same for all nodes, right? So the weight only depends on uh, the number of layers, hence this, this index L, while the attention depends on the pair of nodes, right? Depends on the similarity between this pair of nodes. And uh, this formulation uh, is actually also the, the very similar formulation from transformers. And in fact, in practice, we use um, transformer layers for, um, for our task. So here we can see a bit visually what is happening with all these message passing steps, right? So we have um, image A and B, which are actually depicting the same bird and images C and D, which are also depicting the same bird. So ideally, what we would like at the end of the day is that the embeddings from A and B become very similar and the embeddings from C and D become very similar and dissimilar between each other. So we have here initial attention scores. The first thing that we do is compute the message passing steps. So in this case, for example, we have the update for uh, the feature vector of image A, right? We aggregate this information from the neighbors. The same happens for all the images all the way to image D. And we end up with these two updated feature vectors for A, B, C, and D. And so a cool thing that is happening is that the features for the samples of the same class get more and more similar as we perform more message passing steps while the features for different classes get more and more further apart, which is exactly what we want for the metric learning. And if we look at the attention scores, in fact, between the first message passing step and the second message passing step, the attention scores between similar images, A and B, are increased, and the same happens for C and D. Cool, so just to, to recap a little bit how the optimization works. So we're optimizing, first of all, the backbone CNN and the message passing network in an end-to-end -end fashion. And this is important uh, for how we will actually do the inference. And the cool thing here is that we're implicitly taking all the intrabatch relations into account in this optimization because of these message passing steps. So now we don't need to sample uh, pairs, we don't need to sample triplets, we can simply apply cross-entropy on the updated node feature vectors, and these intra-batch relations are going to be embedded in the feature vectors directly. But the coolest thing is how we actually do inference, right? So if you think about inference, how I presented it at the beginning, you actually have an image A, you obtain an embedding from a CNN, you have an image B, you obtain another embedding, and then you compute a distance, could be, for example, the L2 distance. Um, this doesn't work when you have the MPN also at test time, right? But since we're actually optimizing the backbone, the CNN and the MPN in an end-to-end -end fashion, we can use the features from the CNN during inference. So we don't need to create batches, uh, perform the message passing steps or anything during inference because the information has been encoded in the CNN. 
And we do have an auxiliary loss on the CNN feature embeddings to make that even stronger. Um, but it's already nice that uh, we can actually have inference the same way um, that any other Dmetric learning method does without adding any complexity. Um, so as far as results go, um, we are state of the art on for public data sets. So it works uh, with a variety of objects. So these are kind of the standard um, data sets that we use for this task. We do have, of course, um, some errors, but for example, for this bird, Honestly, I would have no idea that this is a, a different kind of, ver of bird. So really when there is an error, it's because um, the images are looking very, very similar. So in conclusion, um, we have proposed a method to train neural networks for deep metric learning. But the cool thing about it is that we now don't need to go into careful triplet selection uh, we don't need to devise complex uh, sampling schemes. So what we do is we use uh, this message passing network in between the feature embedding and our classification laws. And this already captures the intra batch relationships. So essentially what we're doing is we're making the embeddings of the CNN stronger for deep metric learning. And we also show that we achieve a state-of-the-art results without using the MPN and test time. This is important. Um, we also have actually a method to use the MPN at test time, and we explain how we create the batch. Um, so if you're interested, um, please go ahead and check our paper. So with this, I would like to thank the authors, uh, Jenny and Ismail. And uh, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you, Laura, for this great talk. We would have time for one or two questions. Do we have any from the panel? Yeah, I have a question. Um, this is, I think, uh, an approach that is that needs some supervision, some ground truth. Do you see ways to make this more, say, self self supervised in some form? Um, so we are working on on a self supervised um, version of this, um, but indeed this is um, this is trained with the ground truth classes, right? So you do need to know that that this bird belongs to this class or this star uh, belongs to this other class. Um, but one idea could be to take only um, loose relationships, for example, into account. Um, you could also train it, for example, with uh, with attributes instead of the of the ground truth class, um, or uh, you could go more the the semi supervised learning way. So train it with uh, by taking an image, performing a series of augmentations, and then saying, okay, this image now needs to belong essentially to the same class. Um, so so there could be multiple things that one could do. Yes. All right, great. Maybe one last question from YouTube. And uh, the question is how the neighbors are defined in the message, message parsing network. And um, if each image has uh, the entire data set as a neighborhood or, and does this scale to very large data sets then? Um, so the neighbors are um, the samples in the batch, right? So that's why we say this is intra-batch connections. Mm -hmm. So the graph is created. Uh, with all the samples within one batch. So like one image is not compared to all the elements in the data set, but rather to add the elements in the batch, and then you can change the batch and then make other comparisons. Okay, excellent. Uh, maybe if there's more questions on YouTube, you can also, uh, or also Eric could uh, check YouTube later and answer questions there. Um, in the meantime, we'll move on. Thank you again, Laura, for this great talk. And our next speaker will be uh, Volker Markel from Berlin. And he'll talk to us on data management and machine learning. Volker, please take it away. So, hello, can you hear me now? Yes, 
Okay, so there was some problem here. Well, thanks uh, a lot for having me. So I am probably a bit of a outlier here in the sense that I'm a data management and big data systems researcher who is working very closely together with uh, Klaus Robert Müller in uh, our uh, research center Bifold at the intersection of data management and machine learning. And so I'll probably offer you a little bit of a different perspective today. And that is, uh, I'll talk about the data science process and how to optimize that. And uh, looking at that from the perspective of data management research, where the goal is to scale processes in deployment with respect to human and technical latency. And in order to do so, we tend to draw on methods from computer architecture, statistics, machine learning, distributed systems, compilers, programming languages, and others. And make, let me make this a bit more concrete now. So I'm sure you, you all know about those data science processes that consist usually of five steps when you build a model, right? That is uh, starting with information extraction that we integrate when we have the data sources and then one analyzes the data, builds the model and in the end deploys it. And it's important to point out that a key part of that uh, work when building uh, machine learning applications uh, is information extraction integration often that amounts to 80% uh, or more of the effort. And it's also important to point out that this is usually an iterative uh, process until the model is deployed. And if we look at this now, what happens when we deploy uh, such a model, so what happens is Preston specifies the model building, the analysis, in particular like in a streaming setting, we may uh, want to do so in a, uh, in a way that uh, models may incrementally be even refined. And then the specification is compiled to be executed in a computing infrastructure, potentially on large data sets that are massive, sometimes heterogeneous, need to be integrated. And then uh, one does something with the results, right? So for instance, feeding an application or whatever. So in this process now uh, introduces two important uh, latencies. The one is a human latency that happens during specification time. So it's not always easy to specify those uh, data analysis programs because one has to worry about if you want to execute this in a scalable way on how to parallelize that, how to exploit uh, modern hardware and so on. So how to program that is, is non-trivial. And second, there's also a technical latency because depending on uh, the system and the architecture, there's also questions of how you can efficiently produce those results with the right parallel algorithm using uh, methods like caching or others. And in order to overcome that uh, in the data management community, we are, we are looking at on the one hand for uh, reducing the human latency into concepts like declarative languages where one specifies what one wants to compute and not how to compute it. Uh, and then there is a component which is called an optimizer that automatically parallelizes, automatically distributes, and automatically selects the right processing algorithms depending on the underlying computer architecture. And then, of course, one leverages pre-processing techniques like indexing in order to efficiently process the data or hashing. And uh, with respect to the data processing, one looks into parallelization, distribution, caching, and also, as I mentioned, specific algorithms. So let me make this complete in a specific uh, system that uh, we have been building in Berlin that's called Apache Flink. And that illustrates both the data programmability aspect, which is reducing the human latency and the scalable data stream processing that we use with the technical latency. The first uh, program I would uh, specify a declarative data analysis program. This is in this case, uh, some, some graph analytics. And the system itself internally has an algebraic model that it uses that is based on the concept of relational algebra and the key feature in the context of machine learning is now to combine this with linear algebra and use uh, properties of associativity, commutativity, or distributivity among operations in conjunction with a cost model in order to trade off different implementations and different execution orders of operations. And in this way, the system can automatically arrive at a data flow graph, which describes how the data is being uh, processed and also how the data uh, communication takes place if we're talking about compute clusters or if we're talking about different levels of memory in a memory hierarchy. So how to do all of that in an automatic way that does not uh, you know, require, for instance, an expert GPU programmer or an expert uh, distributed systems uh, programmer. It's also interesting to point out that uh, some research aspects that are currently going on there is to 
used machine learning to uh, build uh, those optimization processes as well, for instance, by learning cost models automatically uh, uh, and, and, and having models based on uh, neural networks or other, uh, you know, entropy maximization approaches and so on. But this all is happening at specification time. It's essentially improving the human latency of this data science process. And now if we look at the runtime, then it is about uh, having efficient algorithms that ensure fault tolerance when parts of the system fail to do resource management, to have uh, both out of core and in core algorithm, which means when the data fits into memory, you want to process data uh, with special algorithms that take advantage of uh, the specific memory and CPU types that you have, but if the data size, because it might be big data, doesn't fit into memory that you want to process, that external algorithms, for instance, plus rotting or data preparation are used at the same time as the memory management, screen processing, and so on. And we have built the system called the Apache Flink, uh, which is an um, open source system. I'll get to that a little bit more later as well, that uh, addresses those issues and in this way facilitates data uh, uh, oriented programming for massive data streams. And the impact of this automatic optimization is uh, drastic. So if we have such a declarative program, this optimizer decides on the execution order, on the parallelization strategy, on whether to use in or out of core algorithms, the physical implementation, and also much relation strategies. And in this way, you could run the same program on a test data set on a laptop, which results in a completely different data flow graph than executing it on a big cluster, but it's still the same program. You don't have to change a single line of code and uh, same data thing you could do is run it much later and after data and the environment has changed and then you would still uh, have a very different execution graph because maybe you have a different compute cluster but you don't have to change the program and this is uh, what, what really is about reducing those types of latencies and with that which was a bit more general overview i want to talk briefly about one specific research contribution and highlight or before I do that though just point out this is an example of such an optimization for natural language processing uh, pipeline uh, that consists of a variety of operators and optimization would include because of algebraic properties of those operations to change the orders uh, between those green boxes that are operations and also for instance change what's gray here which is the different communication patterns in the compute cluster that is local memory or network broadcast also between those operations and of course nobody really wants to hand tune that that's why it's important to have those automatic uh, uh, operations and there's lots of uh, different aspects that can be considered in improving latency and throughput in those systems and we have made several contributions here in compression and also in parallel programming and latency reduction that have earned a couple of awards but i want to uh, focus on one specific highlight that just was uh, that we just published at the International Conference on Data Engineering this year, where we also won the best paper award for that, and that's about uh, contra flow approaches in data flow systems. Because if we talk about uh, uh, processing data, I said data flow systems are good because they scale in clusters and can, things can be distributed. But of course, when you want to write your programs, in particular also in the context of what you do in machine learning applications, uh, you often want to have iterative algorithms, right? You have loops if you want to build a page rank or k-means clustering, a gradient descent, or, or training your, 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 net, your neural network. And the culture form can become quite complex. It can have nested loops. Also, there could be if statements inside the loop, which all is kind of natural, obviously. But this is all a problem if you want to parallelize and scale out the architecture. And uh, in, a, in a data flow, it's hard to do that. And uh, what, what we have come up with is a method for compiling those imperatively written contra flow jobs that you might know when you write in Python or write, when you write the TensorFlow programs into a single data flows job that then can be scaled out and uh, compiled and, and executed in a, in a large compute cluster. And uh, so the way uh, to do that is, uh, I'll, I'll show that, but just to give you an example, is uh, here we see two uh, separate systems. So one that provides specific support for loops, and that's the system Flink that we talked about, which is quite fast, but it's complicated to use because you have to do second order functional programming in, to do, in order to do so. And there's other systems, you, some of you may know Spark or System ML, that would actually run loops or in this way control flow in separate jobs. And in this way, uh, it doesn't really a lot of overhead and the execution time of a job would be much, much longer. So just to make it a bit more concrete, so systems like, for instance, Spark or System ML, that's some, some common Apache project. What they do is they run a data flow in separate jobs where you have a driver program that 
launches, launches a data flow job on the cluster for every invocation, for every time a loop is being executed, each time the step function is executed. And what this means is really, there's a lot of overhead because one has uh, const uh, one constraints internal state to one step and one also has a synchronization barrier among those different potentially parallel computations. And instead, if one runs the data flow job on the cluster directly in an iterative way, one needs a data flow that may have a cycle. So it's a cyclic data flow and that's what those other systems cannot support. And uh, then one does not have to uh, worry about uh, the state. One can keep the state between the steps and one can also pipeline the execution. So this offers a good amount of benefit. And the trick in order to do that is, I will not go into too much details for that because that's probably a bit off topic for uh, a machine learning audience, but one uses some trick from compiler technology, which is called single state assignment, which essentially means one takes control of those statements like while loop, do while loop, break statements, continue or if statements, and put them in the single state assignment, which really means one creates new variables and makes out of any of those contrast flow statements a function invitation that then can be mapped into a data flow. So this is an example. And the only thing to point out here is there's an original program that has some if statement and a loop on the left side. This is translated into an intermediate representation. And the key thing is you see this variable pref is uh, in this case translated into three different variables, pref1, pref2, and pref3. And there are so-called uh, special functions that you see here, for instance, for pref2, that determine a conditional, like the if statement. And this is what the pref3 does here. And what this really means when translates this into a data flow, where each data flow consists of a data flow block that is uh, without any imperative constructs. And the only thing is at the end of, a, of such a block, one may have a jump. And this jump may be conditional and it may be cyclic. And if you do so, then you can actually achieve this uh, uh, optimization to execute a data flow uh, that is coming from a uh, imperative program. And so just to summarize that, so in this way, one can use the simple imperative programming that many of you know, of course, all of you know, I'm sure from, from your standard programming languages, but then compile it into data flow jobs that can be executed on massive clusters and one can do optimizations and I will, cannot go into the details here, but essentially but one can, if there's some data that's invariant in the loop, like a large data that would be uh, computed only once, one can uh, leverage that across the loops and one can also have pipeline execution. And one achieves up to uh, two orders of magnitude speed ups over the existing system. So there's a drastic uh, impact. So this is uh, just to give you an idea on this highlight. And then I switch back to I said, the system that I mentioned before that we built uh, called Apache Flink, because this is probably the biggest success story that came out of uh, Berlin uh, and, and, and our competence center. And that is uh, a data flow system that by now has a, a community of meetups that's almost 30,000 people. Uh, about 870 open source uh, contributors to date, so not people who use it, but really people who advance the system worldwide. Yeah, almost 50 meetup groups and uh, also, yeah, probably more than 50 companies by now that use it. And uh, there's also some, some uh, entrepreneurship that has been going on in that space. And there's highly engaged users of that system. For instance, Alibaba uh, in, in, in China is running that on a thousand node cluster with 5,000 cores and processes millions of events per second. King runs rather complex jobs. It's an online game company in Sweden uh, that runs billion, 30 billions of events daily with, with, with that. And uh, uh, a telco in France, we have a telco that uh, many of our French partners in the workshop probably will know, runs uh, also uh, Flink uh, applications with uh, 10 billion events, which are two terabytes of state uh, process daily. And there's lots of users, so you can see just uh, a list of the companies. Uh, so, so lots of uh, big uh, American companies from Silicon Valley, like Uber, or, uh, also Netflix, but also in, in China, like Tencent or Alibaba, and uh, a large community around it. So with that, I will conclude. So since this is uh, a bit uh, off topic for, for some of you, uh, but but maybe still an interesting impetus, uh, impulse, 
so, so there is lots of current and future research issues that also border this you know intersection between machine learning and, and data management and this is on the systems architecture space where it's about you know exploiting modern hardware but really about then learning data management components in this context of what people would call system 2.0 like learning indexes learning cost models or optimizers there's lots of intersection also respect to data programmability like combining relational linear algebra either has mentioned or also cross-platform optimization if i have different systems from which i draw the data, how do I integrate that efficiently? Uh, at the same time, as we move into the Internet of Things, other types of environments, it's about processing uh, on the edge, heterogeneous distributed environments. So we are actually currently building a new open source system that is uh, succeeding the Flink system that I mentioned, which is called Nebula Stream, that's giving you the URL here, that can handle millions of distributed sources and queries and uh, deals with continuous uh, operation under evolution. And at the same time, uh, of course, uh, it's important to look into infrastructures for sharing data algorithms and resources like compute and storage resources with respect to secure execution and, of course, also uh, uh, specifying and enforcing compliance to organizational and legal constraints like privacy. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Volker. Uh, this was very impressive, in particular also the results and the speedups you can get. We have time for a few questions. Maybe I can start with one. So you already mentioned that you borrow a little bit from compiler technology. And then I was wondering, do these ideas that you presented for um, a data analysis problem, this, this data flow networks, would these also translate to general purpose optimizations in compilers? So when I, for example, implement my machine, uh, my, my computer vision algorithm and wanted to run as fast as possible on my CPU uh, on a single machine, would these ideas also work there or, or not? So, so I, I would argue that, so absolutely they would, so that's the first statement. Uh, I would argue that many compilers for, for a single machine, however, would take those uh, optimizations already into consideration because there it's, if you wish the problem spaces, I, I would say a little bit easier because you're focusing on the memory hierarchy in your machine, you're trying to do uh, latency hiding and so on. So in this respect, uh, compilers already do have concepts like, uh, for instance, exploiting sparse computational dependencies, uh, and, and uh, like even you know the old Fortran compilers already exploited some of that, and modern C uh, compilers uh, do those uh, as well. So in this way, the answer is uh, yes. So if you if you're really uh, targeting that, let's say for instance, across several graphics cards, and you want to parallelize and distribute computation then you could benefit from that. So if it's already, uh, you know, on, on your single CPU setup, then uh, actually I would uh, venture to say that if you use the right compiler, you probably would have that technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe the compiler could benefit from some machine learning as well. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely, they, they can. <laughs> and, and, and that's the interesting intersection here at, uh, you know, learning, you know, some of those performance models, right? Because this is essentially what we're yeah, doing yeah. In, in data management. So that you know for those operations, depending on the physical computer architecture, mm -hmm. what kind of performance model do you have so that you can bring together your code? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Do we have maybe one more question before we have to conclude? Otherwise, uh, maybe you can also visit YouTube and, and check for people's questions later. Mm -hmm. um, then we would conclude this session. Uh, thanks for all the speakers again, and thanks for all the viewers. Uh, we'll be back in about 20 minutes with the next session. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the French German Machine Learning Symposium. It's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Bernard Schoukop from Tumingen, uh, who will talk about causal learning. Bernard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's an honor to speak in this uh, workshop. Yeah. And uh, I would like to uh, use the next 15 to 20 minutes to tell you a little bit about causal learning <clears throat> more on a conceptual level uh, without going into details, but uh, including a few pointers to, to uh, projects and papers where there are details. So uh, the whole uh, uh, story for uh, me started around uh, 10 years ago. So we had started working on causality maybe 15 years ago, initially uh, focusing on the problem of causal discovery. Uh, but around 10 years ago, so 10 years ago, we started getting intrigued by uh, how to use causality for machine learning. <coughs> and uh, remember, one particular problem we discussed was this uh, neural net, net tank urban legend that probably many of you know. So in this uh, story, there's a neural net uh, which is trained to classify tanks with high accuracy. Uh, but subsequently, it's found to have uh, succeeded only by focusing on one particular feature. Uh, different versions of the story have different features, but let's say it's the weather. Uh, uh, on, on focusing on this feature that contains information about the type of tank due to the data collection process. So let's say all American tanks were uh, collected on a sunny day and all Russian tanks on a cloudy day or something like that. Now, clearly such a system uh, doesn't exhibit robustness when tested on new tanks whose images are taken under different circumstances. And that's what they what they found. It didn't work uh, when they wanted to deploy this system. <coughs> and uh, at the time, so my, my hope was that somehow, or feeling was that somehow a classifier that incorporates causality could be made invariant <coughs> with respect to this kind of uh, changes or could be made robust. And uh, I had been interested in invariance uh, for quite a while, uh, working on it in the, uh, in the context of support vector machines and kernel PCA. And I would like to take this opportunity. So one particular work, person that I worked with uh, at that time was uh, Olivier Chappelle, working on invariant uh, kernels. And uh, Olivier Chappelle, as many of you know, uh, passed away last year, uh, almost to the day today. So one, one, one year and one day ago. So <clears throat> I would... Uh, uh, remember him and, and dedicate this talk to Olivier. So um, our uh, first project in this direction, so we had been thinking about this problem for several years, and then I, I got an invitation uh, to, to give a, a keynote talk at NeurIPS, and I was very eager to speak about causality and to speak about this problem, but I, we hadn't really, I think hadn't crystallized yet, so we forced ourselves, <coughs> we went to the Black Forest for a week, and with Dominique forced ourselves to uh, start putting something to paper uh, and this resulted in this this first paper which was later published with, under a different name at icml uh, about uh, which was about robustness about invariance and uh, somewhere in the in the introduction it also says it's about how to leave the the comfort zone of iid data <coughs> so that's where it started uh, for us and um, i should say uh, there's a completely separate thrust and in, in, in the end I think they kind of converged to something similar and that thrust was started by Joshua and others uh, and that was about uh, disentanglement and uh, and how to find the factors of variation underlying data and I remember I was at the time I was in the uh, advisory board of the CIFAR program and, uh, and Joshua was talking about this problem for the next uh, grant extension and uh, to me, it sounded like he's speaking about a causal problem. So I, I kept telling him, look, I think this is really about causality. Um, and I think by now we have kind of, uh, maybe he has moved a little bit in the causal direction and, and I moved in the deep learning direction. And uh, I think there's now a, a lively field at the intersection of those two. And I want to tell you a little bit about this today. So, um, so I would argue, like to argue that uh, disentanglement as it's studied now in deep learning has something to do with has something to do with independence. That's what people usually connect it to, but uh, this should go beyond statistical independence and, and go closer to causality. And uh, one example, uh, this is also a computer vision uh, heavy workshop. Uh, you all know this object uh, called the Boucher chair. And when you see this object, uh, of course your brain makes the, or when we see any object, our brain makes the assumption that the object and the mechanism of perception, so in particular, the direction from which we look at it, uh, are independent. 
and uh, uh, our uh, perception uh, builds on this assumption because if we violate this by looking through this uh, particular hole thus coupling the perception process the direction of gaze uh, or the direction of viewing and and the object structure uh, then a uh, perception fails because we perceive a structure which is in reality is not there um, so this is uh, it's connected to this generic viewpoint assumption it's also connected to uh, something uh, called structure for motion motion uh, because if you think about uh, if you move your head if you take an object you move your head around it uh, then you implicitly assume that uh, as you move your head only the mechanism of perception changes but the object itself is in variance <laughs> so we postulate that the causal generative process is composed of autonomous modules that do not inform or influence each other and uh, so we've been uh, trying to use this principle in different guises uh, in deep learning and this is very much an ongoing uh, process and uh, um, so before uh, showing you some examples, I want to first tell you a little bit more about uh, how to formalize this principle or what it means, slightly more formal than so far. And uh, so the examples will be in these directions, but uh, first let's formalize it a little bit. And uh, to this end, uh, let's first uh, remind ourselves what is a structural causal model. So this is one way to write down a causal model. Maybe you are more familiar with causal graphical models or, or graphical models. So a causal graphical model would be a graphical model where the direction of the edges, so a, a directed graphical model where the direction of the ed edges corresponds to the direction of causation. Uh, but underlying each such uh, causal graphical model, uh, there is a structural causal model, or there's actually many structural causal models giving rise to the same one. So the structural causal model actually contains more information. And uh, so we start with a, a DAG uh, with a set of vertices. Uh, we think of the vertices as observables, the arrows as direct causation. And we assume that each uh, uh, vertex uh, is each random variable or observable. Each vertex is a function, a deterministic function of its parents and a noise variable. And these noise variables are jointly independent. <coughs> and the noise variables are also called unexplained. So sometimes the shorthand U uh, is used. And, uh, and this, so this is a, a structural causal model or a nonlinear structural equation model. And it has various properties, Markov properties, et cetera. And uh, people have spent a lot of time trying to infer such models from observational data. So uh, if you can make interventions, then it's sort of re relatively easy to uh, learn such models. But if you're only observing, so clearly, if you specify distribution over the noises, this implies a distribution over the observed variables. So given that distribution, given even complete knowledge of that distribution, turns out it's non-trivial to uh, uh, reconstruct or to infer this model. Um, and that's the problem of causal discovery. So that's what usually is being studied. Uh, but today I want to talk about a slightly different problem. And one could say that's the problem of causal representation learning. Because uh, these structural causal models, one could say, uh, are in a way already at the symbolic level. Someone gives you the symbols, and now you're asking the question how they are related to each other and what kind of processes can you do with them. So it's a little bit like the, the pre-machine learning version of AI. Uh, but in reality, we might not be given these causal variables, so we might want to infer them from high-dimensional data. And uh, so we have to have high-dimensional inputs and then somehow a mapping to this symbolic level. And then uh, uh, in that level, uh, somehow embed a structural causal model. So, um, so what do we, uh, I, I promised I'll say something about this entanglement. So first of all, I should say, given such a model, um, so uh, given such a model, then I can always write the joint distribution in a particularly nice uh, factorization, uh, which is this one. So uh, it turns out, uh, uh, essentially, since the noise terms uh, are uh, independent from each other, uh, I can write the joint distribution as a product of conditionals, where the conditionals are only uh, uh, conditioned on the parents of the respective nodes. So that's uh, a much lower dimensional object than, than it's just a generic decomposition of the joint distribution. So that's nice. Uh, but we will ask for one more thing uh, um, to hold true, and that's related to this assumption that I told you about before with the Vichy chair. Uh, we will require that uh, these objects here, these conditionals, uh, are also independent from each other in the sense that 
<coughs> if I change one of them, for instance, by an intervention or by a suitable domain shift, uh, if I change one of them, it doesn't automatically change the other ones. So I can intervene on them, on them independently, uh, or uh, if I change one of them, the others remain invariant. So that's a particular kind of assumption, which is not the same as uh, statistical independence be between the EXI. In fact, the XI, if the graph is non-trivial, uh, will not be statistically independent from each other. So let's assume both these things are true, then uh, we could call this the uh, disentangled or, or causal factorization. And uh, there's a special case if the graph is trivial, so there are no parents, uh, all the nodes are disconnected, then uh, this disentanglement will simply reduce to statistical independence. And, uh, and, and traditional disentanglement methods look at statistical independence, but I think it's only part of the story. Now, if this is a disentangled factorization, what would be an example of an entangled one? Well, uh, an entangled one would be for instance, this kind of factorization, which you can get by applying the chain rule of, of probabilities. And, uh, and there are many such factorizations because for any possible ordering or any permutation of these indices, you would get a different such factorization. Now, while these factorizations are mathematically valid, uh, it's important to point out that uh, um, they don't have this uh, nice disentanglement property because if you now change, for instance, if you were to change one of these mechanisms, so these things in the causal graph, we think of as physical mechanisms. If we change one of these guys, of course, the overall distribution changes. Uh, then typically, if we then factorize that distribution according to this equation, uh, typically all of these terms will change simultaneously. So we don't have this uh, kind of sparsity or locality. And uh, that leads to uh, an assumption, which one could call the sparse mechanism shift hypothesis. And this assumption says, so I just told you in the generic case, all of these guys are coupled to each other and change at the same time. Now the assumption is, which is a, it's a physical assumption about the world, that uh, for the causal factorization, this is not the case. So for the causal factorization, uh, if uh, uh, one distribution shifts to another one, let's say we have two distributions in the real world that we think are related to each other, and then we would assume that this change between the two distributions manifests itself uh, sparsely in, in this disentangled factorization. So only few of these terms, or at least not all of them, should change simultaneously. <coughs> and um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. I've been talking too much, much about the basics. Uh, so there are different ways uh, we've applied these ideas. One is uh, in a project about learning independent mechanisms. So here we have a competitive system that uh, given distorted versions of images, uh, tries to learn the mechanisms that led to these distortions and automatically uh, identifies these mechanisms and automatically undoes them in order to sort of classify uh, uh, the distorted images. And then turns out we learn mechanism that, uh, mechanisms that transfer to other problems. In this case, they transfer to a completely uh, different kind of, of characters without, uh, without retraining. So that's one example. Uh, here's another example uh, where we try to learn uh, uh, low-dimensional representations of images uh, which have certain properties that uh, make interventions possible or that make interventions sensible. And in this case, the uh, type of interventions are uh, what one could call hybridization, that you uh, combine uh, uh, certain latent representations from one image uh, with another one. This is a uh, work of Michel Vissel. And uh, here's, for instance, it leads to an intervention which you could argue is intervening selectively on the background uh, of this uh, uh, chicken. Uh, or here's another example where we have two real images on the left and on the right, and then we produce a synthetic image in between, which is not an interpolation, but you could say some kind of causally meaningful interpolation, because this looks a little bit, this is a teddy bear, it's a koala, uh, looks a little bit like a koala teddy bear. <coughs> uh, another example, uh, we're here, we, we try to put in the causal bias uh, using a suitable structure, where we learn an autoencoder that's uh, embedded into itself, has a structural causal model uh, in a generic form. Uh, so you, you can, you can add and translate each uh, a, a structural causal model that's based on a DAG into such a, a topological ordering. And uh, it turns out that uh, uh, even though in this case, we don't explicitly enforce uh, independence disentanglement, we, we do get uh, uh, 
good reconstruction quality, uh, good FID scores, and also uh, sensible disentanglements, but I won't go into further detail on that. <coughs> a more recent, uh, uh, or, or actually more recent than the, than the first one, uh, we started working with this in 2019. Uh, this is a, a project uh, where we try to do something like this, uh, uh, like this thing here, um, but we try to do it in recurrent systems for uh, dynamical processes. So this is using recurrent, a certain type of recurrent network, uh, where you have uh, sort of modules that have a default dynamics and that sparsely interact with, with each other. Most of the time, they just follow their default dynamics, but then sort of mediated by an attentional uh, bottleneck, they sparsely interact with each other. And uh, uh, that gives you another kind of uh, causal or modular decomposition of this overall process. And uh, just uh, to give a few pointers, so <coughs> some of these uh, works. So this one was just, uh, it just appeared at uh, iClear. And there's a few uh, related projects. There's a, a, a follow-up project of this one already. Uh, and and some other projects here. Um, I also wanted to mention this one. Uh, uh, this is uh, on uh, dis disentanglement rep rep disentangled representation learning from correlated data. Uh, so this is trying to evaluate the standard disentanglement methods and what happens to them if uh, your data are actually correlated, which is of course uh, often the case. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, so so in a sense, the intuition is uh, if you like you might often see, I think this example that Joshua once gave, uh, the presence of a fork and a knife on the table is of course uh, strongly correlated, but that doesn't mean that they are one object. You can still separately intervene on forks and knives. And if you wanted to sort of reconstruct a table scene, uh, you probably would like to represent fork and knife separately. But if you then train on correlated data, then a standard statistical method is not gonna uh, nicely factor out this representation. And <laughs> so in this study, uh, we, we compare a lot of methods in that respect and then also suggest some, some ideas how to, how to handle that using, uh, for instance, using weak supervision. Um, <coughs> another project I want to mention, uh, this is about connections to reinforcement learning. Uh, so here it's, it's kind of building on the idea that uh, uh, the search for invariance or the search for sparse changes uh, or sparse responses of environments to your actions is actually a useful bias uh, or a useful reward uh, for reinforcement learning. So that's another paper which uh, will appear at ICML this year. <coughs> and uh, maybe I will try to come to the end now. Okay, so there's a, a, a lot of discussion lately, not just on disentanglement, but also on object-centric representations. Um, so from my point of view, and I don't know, it would be interesting how the computer vision people see that from my point of view, uh, object-centric is should be a special case of a real uh, causal generative model of a scene. So object-centric means you want to factor out certain properties of the object, uh, factor it out from, from other elements of an image, other objects or a lighting, orientation, position, etc. And uh, uh, I'm also quite interested in, in, in causal generative scene models. Uh, we started working on this last year and we are currently working on, on another paper in this direction. So I'm going to uh, skip this. So this is my favorite application of causality in scientific data analysis, where we found exoplanets. And uh, we were very lucky because it turned out later one of the planets that we found uh, ended up being the, the first one that, had, uh, that was in a habitable zone around its uh, star and uh, was proven to have uh, water vapor. So uh, uh, my conclusion slide. So the long-term goal here is to learn uh, uh, causal models from multiple tasks in multiple environments. And I think they need to reuse components and that probably requires that components are robust across tasks. And I think a sensible inductive bias for this is to look for independence, uh, independence in the sense of causal mechanisms. And um, I talked a little about this entanglement. I, I have to admit, I find the problem not yet sufficiently well-defined and we're trying to contribute to that. Uh, I think overall, uh, we have made a lot of progress in uh, representation learning, but usually that refers to the representation of fixed probability distributions, so to the IID setting. Uh, but I think our brains need to represent uh, uh, causal, they should co represent causal modules that capture not just one distribution, but a whole class of interventional distributions. 
and shift the distributions. And I think it's it's totally open how we represent those. And probably it has to do with <coughs> also with reinforcement learning, causality, planning, reasoning, et cetera. And, and, and one could say what it has to do with, with thinking in this sense of Conrad Lohmann's. And uh, I, I, I was tempted, I took a snapshot of Jan's talk yesterday. So I thought I can show a Zoom inside a Zoom now. Um, I think, <coughs> so I agree with uh, these challenges. Um, I think I would even argue that the challenge two and three, I think causality has to do with all of them, but I think the challenge two and three may in the end be very close to each other. Um, because uh, if we, so I think Jan was, uh, was citing this book here uh, that he uh, took from Jitendra. Uh, I would like to add the book of Conrad Lorenz, where, where Conrad Lorenz says that thinking is actually nothing but acting in an imagined space. So these, these models, uh, uh, the models to plan complex action sequences are in a, worst, in a way the first step towards uh, thinking and, and reasoning. Uh, so I think with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and give you some pointers for further reading. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. <clears throat> this was quite exciting. Uh, there are some questions on YouTube as well. Uh, so if you have a chance to look into the YouTube chat, I think that would be best. Uh, also, we can take some questions maybe later in the break, but in the I, interest of time- yeah, I, don't, I, would... I don't have the chat open. So if you have it handy, maybe you can just read one of them to me. <laughs> Otherwise, if I stop uh, looking for the YouTube now. Yes. I can. Let's let's do them in the break because we're a little okay. bit over the time already, and I don't want to cut anyone else's time. So uh, Jean, uh, maybe if I can ask you to share screen and sure. Uh, so the next speaker is Jean Pons from Paris. Do you, do you see the do you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so um, hello all. So today I'm going to talk about uh, about deep learning, uh, deep learning sharp images. I, I will I will come to what it means in a second. Uh, this is part of uh, this is the work of Thomas Eboli, a student of mine, and uh, Chen Sun at uh, Xi'an Jiaotong University in China, and he's the co-advisor of Thomas. And uh, this is part of a, a more general kind of program for my research where I, I like image restoration because I think it's a, it's a good good topic for, for machine learning and for vision because we typically have a good physical model of, what, of what's happening. We have good image formation models. We have pretty good priors and natural images. And, uh, and we can relatively easily generate pretty good uh, simulate the training examples, which is not the case always in vision. And what I like as well is that often you can mix, you can mix the kind of the classical variational type of approaches, inverse problem approaches with, with uh, deep learning, CNN type of stuff. So I think it, it all fits, it all fits well together. And of course, what I will talk about is related to what uh, Julien Beral talked about um, earlier. Okay, uh, so. So the, 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 the specific problem I'm going to, to assume is that I'm going to assume that I'm given some, um, some let's see, some uh, raw images and that I want to, uh, to de-blur them, demosaic them, and I will come back to what demosaicing means in a second, and denoise them as well. So the way we are going to, to, uh, to model, model the process is that you have, you have a camera, it generates in the image plane, a sharp continuous image X. Uh, this image X is transformed into a blurry continuous image B by, by the camera optics. And that can be related to, to motion of, in the scene or to defocus, but also to the, to the, the actual PSF of the, of the lens. I mean, uh, a lens doesn't, doesn't image a point into a point, it image a point into a blob always. And that's what that's what I mean in the title by uh, debugging sharp sharp images. So you 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 have this perfect image X. It goes to a blurry image B, and then this continuous image is going to be uh, converted into a digital image by your sensor. And as uh, Julian pointed out earlier this morning, uh, most imaging sensors use 
uh, this color pattern with little filters in front of each pixel. So what you, what the camera observes really is 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 a is a filter black and white image that then you need to to interpolate to recover a full RGB image. So all this here happens in the analog domain after uh, Anatole Digital uh, conversion. You will get you will get a mosaic image uh, behind the Bayer pattern, and what you would like. Here now we are in the so-called linear RGB uh, realm. What you would like is to, to recover the um, high-resolution digital image, uh, small x here. Okay, so you can do in in two ways. You can do it by first demosaicing uh, the image, and then once you have done the mosaic again, you can deblur the image, or you can try to directly directly demosaic and deblur the image, denoising it at the same time. This is a bit different from what people typically do, where typically people assume that the, the, the blurring and the deblurring happen in the sRGB image. So the S, sRGB is what your, your camera is going to give to you. And that's what usually you are going to store as a JPEG, JPEG image. But after you starting from the linear RGB domain where all the physics happening if you want in the in the digital domain then you have your your camera internally does some uh, image processing that's quite non-linear to create the image that you are going to to record and store okay so physically the, the the blurring process is not really happening there it's happening between the the camera and in the linear rgb domain so we are going to to work in in the raw raw domain uh, right after the conversion and in the linear rgb domain Okay, I cannot I cannot cite all the work uh, that has been done in deblurring and 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 denoising and the mosaicing all over the years because there's been a huge amount of it. Let me just uh, focus on on a couple of things. Uh, we are going to um, to use later some of the work by Bernard on estimating PSF and removing PSF uh, PSF blur from images. We are going to use. Uh, the ISP pipeline from uh, Bruxelles that allows you to take from that models if you want the physics of the uh, and the processing of the uh, ISP pipeline. So it allows you to go from an sRGB image to a raw uh, to a linear RGB image that you can use. So you can uh, generate uh, synthetic examples for training. And then uh, a key component we are going to use is a recent sampling method by uh, uh, Zeng, uh, Zeng et al. from ETH. So the um, model is quite simple. Uh, this is the visual uh, forward model. The, the image that you observe, that is the, the raw image Y, is obtained from the, uh, the uh, linear RGB image X by applying to ink a, a non-blur, we are going to assume it's non, a blur kernel due to the optics of the camera, and then a mosaicing operator that's going to uh, filter the images and then down some, sample them on the, on the Bayer grid. And then we are going to have some noise, and the noise we are going to assume depends on the uh, the, the the colors, the, the color level, the intensity level, and it has it's a it's an affine noise with two parameters corresponding shot and read noise. Okay, so this is the model we are going to use. The typical way people have done done it before is rather by using a two-layer model, where first you demosaic the image using a demosaic oper operator, and then you look at the pure deep learning problem. Okay, so we are going to compare the two approaches, and we'll see that in fact the joint model uh, works better. So the approach we are using is fairly classical. You take what you are, we are going to formulate the recovery of the image X as a regularly square problem, where the uh, the regularizer omega uh, gives you a real image uh, constraints. Uh, this this has often done. We are going to solve by introducing an auxiliary variable z that we are going to uh, force to be equal to x, and so we have this we have this uh, simple model. And what we are going to do is we are going to do iterations. We are going to increase the parameter beta so that uh, z and x are going to become closer and closer. We can use, of course, the same approach. In the two-stage two-stage two model, in this case again, you will have a separate uh, the mosaic uh, function, and then you will have also this this thing with the uh, the um, variables. 
So in aspergillary splitting, what you do is you are going to, to have an iterative process and you are going to iteratively solve for the, the, um, the, uh, the, the Z variable, the auxiliary variable, and then you are going to solve for the X variable. And the two, the two are going to be solved, using, uh, found, solved for using different methods. And then you increase the beta parameter at each iteration to force X and Z to, to uh, coincide at the end. You need to initialize the process. You can initialize the process by taking the initial image normally, or in our case, uh, the mosaic method obtained by some method or another. This is very simple iterative process. You can use um, more sophisticated methods such as ADMM, but it has turned out to work pretty well in our case. So to estimate X, uh, basically, uh, you have to solve this, uh, this, uh, this optimization problem. Uh, this the optimization problem is the same uh, for both the one stage and two stage methods. And basically, what you, the only need, the thing you need for that is to write the proximal operator phi for your, for your regularized. And in fact, in our case, we'll do just like uh, Julien did this morning. In the end, we'll replace um, a closed form regularizer by a learn, a learn uh, close form proximal uh, operator, I'm sorry, by a learn proximal operator. For the, the, the estimation of the exterior variable, uh, you simply have uh, a least squares problem, a linear least squares problem, which are pretty easy, but uh, the, the, um, the variables and the operators are huge, so these things can be computationally quite expensive. Uh, you have very efficient methods based on fast Fourier transform. You can also use uh, conjugate gradient method or fixed point iterations. Uh, the fast Fourier transform method uh, tend to be uh, more efficient. In the one stage uh, method that we are using, um, using the FFT method is a bit more complicated because what we want to do is uh, take into account the fact that the blur is not, is not a gray level blur. blur uh, depends on the wavelength. In particular, you have uh, lenses are affected by chromatic aberrations due to the fact that uh, different wavelengths are not refracted in the same way. Okay, so the, uh, you are going to need to use uh, a blur kernels that depend on, on, the, on the color, on the red, green, or blue color. And then, of course, you have the, the uh, decimation operator, DR, DG1, DG2, and DB, corresponding to the fact that you go to a full resolution frame to a, a lower resolution one corresponding to each one of the two components. They are in typically, in typical uh, Bayer patterns, you have two, uh, two of the pixels are green, and so you are going to need to combine those two. And then you are going to solve for Z, uh, channel by channel, so for R, G, and B. And this, uh, to do this very efficiently, what we did is adopt the, uh, the fast rate transform and of Zeng et, et al. Uh, to our case, you have to be a little bit careful because of the mosaicing pattern. All right. With this, uh, you can write a function such as this one that will take as input uh, the raw image, the kernel value that you assume to be known, the mo mosaic. Um, the mosaicing mask and a bunch of parameters, including the parameters uh, related to the, to the noise. The way this function is written is simple. That's one of, of the beauties of, uh, of uh, in, in image restoration. You have interpretable things, you know what to do. Uh, so we are going to learn the weights that are used in the, uh, in the Afghanistan splitting algorithm uh, from the noise characteristics. Uh, then we are going to initialize by doing using some separate the mosaicing uh, algorithm. The better the algorithm, of course, the better the initialization. And then we are going to enroll a few iterations of um, HQS. First, we'll compute Z uh, using the, the efficient uh, FFT uh, square solution. Then we will have a learnable uh, proximal operator. This is the, again the plug and play prior uh, that Julien talked about this morning. So in this, in this, in this function, we have several, several, par several parameters that are learnable. You have the parameters that for predicting from the noise parameter, the beta and gamma parameters. You might have par learnable parameters in the, the mosaicing function, and then you have learnable parameters 
in the um, in the uh, in the in the proxy operator as well. And this function will output a, a linear RGB image. And of course, you could write the same thing for the two-stage function. The difference is that the, the, the mosaicing is done once, and once the mosaicing is done, you never operate on the raw image anymore, and so you never uh, question your mosaicing if you want. So to train this thing, we use uh, we use uh, synthetic data. Let me look at my watch. I don't know how much time I have. Synthetic that data uh, where we we take a sharp a good quality RGB, sRGB image, we convert them to raw images using the pipeline from Box et al, which is uh, which is um, a good physical uh, model of what's happening and also is differentiable. Then we uh, we submit the image to RGB blurring with different kernels depending on the channel, and we uh, we basically create kernels and then we. We rotate and, and deform the kernels a bit depending on the color, and then we we add uh, a good affine noise model against from Bukel to 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 um, noise up if you want the image. Uh, all this uh, is a training for, but we also need a, a loss a loss to uh, to um, to uh, supervise. We need to supervise the, the the training function, and so what we do we do two things. We consider both. Uh, for ground truth, both linear RGB and sRGB uh, models. The first, the first uh, loss that we use, we take the uh, linear RGB uh, image X that we are given, and then we minimize the difference between what our, what our algorithm, that is called it F row, computes from the, uh, the raw image and the, the kernel and the mosaicing operator. Or we can also take an sRGB a ground truth, and then we need to apply the uh, raw to sRGB pipeline S to our function. But S is on, again differentiable, so both for both functions we can uh, back propagate the error uh, throughout the functions, and then train train our, our, our model uh, according. So we we did some some testing for on, on synthetic data. Uh, I'm not going to, to 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 spell out all the all the lines in that in that in that table. The main message is that it works pretty well. So in bold, you have the, the best method over some standard standard uh, data set with without and with noise. What is interesting is that in the end, um, so we want we want to operate on an, an in RGB and on raw images, but in the end, the, the images you are going to look at are the, the sRGB. And so when we, it turns out that when we train, um, we train with sRGB supervision, of course, we get better results in the sRGB domain, and we can get quite significant, quite significant uh, improvements in the, um, in the reconstruction. And the last two lines show that using a good, a good, uh, a good demosaicing method for the initialization actually makes a difference as well. You should always do that. Here are some uh, qualitative and quantitative examples and synthetic images. So our method is on the right, and as you can see in the uh, in the, uh, in the in the zoomed in portions, this gives this gives a sharper sharper result than the uh, uh, a two stage method. And again, those are two two good do two good demosaicing and um, and uh, and deblurring methods. It's a bit more sharper, and the details are a bit better. And then uh, we also we took we got that from uh, Bernard and former students. So those are um, Schuller did for his PSG was is he submitted the PSF and if an image again this is this is a sharply uh, sharply focused image. Um, you estimate the PSF either for calibration or for an estimation process. So he took that image and we tried. We tried our method on this, and here we show a comparison between the original image on the top, what should obtain with the, 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 the first, I think 26 is wrong, I think the first technique here, and what we got. And if you zoom in a bit, uh, you see that we are a little bit sharper. What's interesting is that there are some um, chromatic aberration that are, uh, of course, present in the original image. You can see the, the red band here and the green one underneath. 
they're still, and they seem to be a bit inverted in Schuller's method. It's a bit difficult to see, and they are mostly gone in hours. This is an example from a real image from a, a photographer. And this is the input image, and this is the, uh, the blurred image. The uh, PSF in this case, again, this is a sharp image. The PSF in this case is the same camera setting as in uh, Schuller's uh, setting. So we had the PSF and we could remove it. Uh, and we also did some uh, PSF removal comparison synthetic images as well, I think, of 12. One thing that I find interesting is that we are all happy about this. And then we, we, we took this, this image here. Um, and uh, this image is uh, quite saturated in parts. And, um, and it's taken with the Canon 5D. It's an expensive camera, but still it saturates. And here in the middle is the results of our method. And you can see, for example, in this bar that has become green. And you have, you have this, these big stains, these big color stains on the thing. And so we, we wondered at the beginning what I saw. Then we looked at the data. On the left, you have the, 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 road, the raw image signal along the vertical line here. And on the right, you have the, the sRGB uh, channels. And you can see that the, the, the signal in both cases is skipped when the image gets saturated. And so, of course, the linear model that we have doesn't work anymore at all. OK, so there have been a few works attempting to deal with saturation, but it's a, it's a complicated problem. So we, had, as a first attempt, what we have done is to, um, to just train our method with saturated images that we, uh, that we, uh, that we generated, again, using a mixture of the, of the, the, the let's say that, um, the, uh, the, the, the ASP pipeline and the, the physical model. So on the left here, you have the original blur image. On the right, you have restoration using a white, white et al that uh, estimates the, the motion directly from this. At the bottom, we estimated the motion using a pan et al in both images. Uh, this is using two stage and this is ours. There are still some artifacts. Let me show you a close up. And again, we don't deal perfectly with saturated images. So this is still open for us. But you can see, for example, uh, here on the left, that the one stage method is gets much sharper, sharper results than the two stage methods. So I'm done. Uh, so what's next? Next, uh, we want to deal with chromatic aberrations. So what I've shown you is, is, is simple chromatic aberrations. But you have many types. You have something called color fringing. You have lateral, but you have forward uh, chromatic aberrations. We want to take those into account. We want to train not just from synthetic images, but from real images. And so we have, we have some ideas about that. Uh, we want to bring together what uh, Julien talked about this morning with Bruno, Bruno Lecoy, super resolution, and with Thomas, um, the mosaicic and deep blurring work and uh, put them together and also include PSF uh, prediction. And uh, we want to apply this to as amateur and professional astronomy. So I, I don't know if Bernard is aware of that, but we are, Julia and I also starting to work on, uh, on exoplanet discovery uh, with, uh, with people from Observatoire de Paris, but in, in the optical domain. And also uh, Yann Lequin has, bo has bought this very expensive telescope and we want to, we want to uh, to, uh, to super resolve and deep blur and denoise these images. So uh, astronomy, I think, is a great, great field for that. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Jean. Thank you for your presentation. We're a little bit short of time again. Is there any, maybe one short question? I'll have one very short question. <clears throat> your method, Jean, assumes that you know the mosaicing pattern yeah. Is there ways to somehow infer that from data as well, so that I can just apply it to a random camera without knowing what mosaicing pattern it is? Normally, if I took a random camera, I would, uh, I would open the manual and look for the mosaicing pattern. <laughs> That's, uh, <laughs> that was short question, short answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, but you can imagine, you can imagine maybe some applications. So we haven't thought about it, but yeah. It okay. 
Thank you very much, John. Uh, <clears throat> let's take the further discussion into the into the break as well. Uh, now we have our last speaker of, of the symposium, uh, Christian Kersting. Um, could you share your slides? And wonderful. Yes, Christian, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's an amazing workshop. I made too many notes, um, so but that's a good sign. Um, yeah, so I would love to talk a bit about neurosymbolic concept learning and all the credits go to Wolfgang, Patrick, Carl, Adam and Hikaru. So what is this all about? Um, I think in particular in the last two years, maybe, and uh, we have heard a lot of discussions again about, well, do we need symbols? Where do symbols come from? Do we really need them? Is differential programming anything that we really need? Um, I don't want to give you an answer here. I take a very pragmatic view. I think we should just embrace both of, of them and really use them. And let me illustrate that by um, slides from um, our from, from MIT. And it's all about visual reasoning. But keep in mind, I'm actually quite new to computer vision. But we have a scene here. And now you would like to not only understand that they are objects, but you would like to also infer somehow features of the objects. Right? And we can do that. You, take any of your favorite um, deep neural network for that and you can do something like that. Why? Why is that interesting? Well, for example, for visual question answering. And I think what you see here, you can do that instantly as a human. And somehow the game is now to also get machines being able to do that, right? So for example, you can ask now, what is the shape of the red object? Uh, but now because we have a symbolic representation, it's a very simple task, right? It's just in a sense like, what Volker Markel was also talking about, it's a kind of data management um, question and inference question, right? So you just check out uh, which object is red, and then you can also talk about the other property of that object and say, well, um, it's a sphere, right? And you get the answer. And so there are a lot of interesting um, models now popping up on that. Here you see one from MIT that is actually blur blurring, in my opinion, a bit the distinction between what is uh, symbolic and what is, so to say, deep or neural or differentiable. Um, but it's less about the system in particular here, uh, because there are tons of other approaches already existing. Also, if you take a slightly different perspective, for example, from the probabilistic perspective, how to really get program programmatic abstractions and trying to make use of that. So in a sense, what you could wonder is, are we done? I mean, is it a nice discussion next to this question of where do the, uh, the symbols come from? But in a sense, one may argue, well, we have already quite a lot of progress there in a lot of different frameworks. And of course we can improve them, but conceptually there is already a lot done. And actually we also saw that and I just was happy that I could take now the screenshot because I was just taking a screenshot of Jan yesterday, but now I could also take the screenshot of Bernhard referring to Jan, so all these different questions and how do we get reasoning in there? How do we get causality in there? Seems to be very, very big. And yeah, there are some, some approaches. But I think we are not there yet. And this is very important. And I'm also happy that uh, Klaus Robert Müller was giving a talk, although about a slightly different um, topic here. But I think we also understand that these systems we are building are getting quite complex. And maybe because of that, um, they become a kind of black box, right? We would like to better understand what is going on there, right? For a particular output here, for example, using uh, rele uh, rele relevance propagation, we would like to understand what is the important part of the input uh, that led to maybe the decision or had most impact on the output on the prediction. Now, to be honest, I, I, I think XAI, explainable AI is amazing, but it's somehow maybe also not really what we need in the long run. I mean, it's the first step, but not the last step. So let me illustrate that here. So with these kinds of techniques, you can do interesting things. You can ask for explanations, right? So you get the scene, for example, and you could, if you know that the concept is something like there are large cube and a large uh, cylinder, um, you can now ask your system, explain me your decision for being a positive um, example here and you get an illustration, right? But most of the explainable AI techniques, they do not suggest how to fix this. If there's something wrong, it's a bit like 
I don't know whether you know Prolog, but Prolog, if something is really wrong, it typically gives back no as an answer, right? It's a bit frustrating. So you would like to also debug the system and maybe do not start from scratch. So you would like to somehow close the loop. And for example, you can close the loop by asking a user. Um, there are different approaches for that. Maybe one of the earliest one was this uh, work on right for the right reasons by Ross et al, where they assume a differentiable loss. We were extending that to a model agnostic one uh, by making use of perturbations. So the user can give feedback or another system saying, yes, it is an example um, for the concept, but it's not because of those pixels, right? So you can make a big step and make use of this um, explanation to essentially implicitly change a bit of the loss function. At least that's one way of viewing it. And I think we had another interesting talk today uh, by, by uh, Martin Muller about this question of maybe we need more flexibility in the loss, loss function. So that, that's maybe one, one way here. And we also applied that to really interesting data on understanding hyperspectral images um, in order to understand how plants are reacting to stress. And here it's a particular biotic stress. So uh, we inoculate particular diseases. And then we were trying to understand how they react to that using hyperspectral images. And the problem there was as well, if you use a convolutional neural network or some other, whatever your, your favorite one is, I mean, at least mainstream model, then it starts overfitting in the sense of making the right predictions, but really for the wrong reasons. And then by interacting with the experts, you can actually force us in a sense to select the at least more plausible, biologically more plausible reasons in the input modality. Now, problem is, even if you apply this explanatory interactive learning uh, to the case that you see here, it fails somehow. And this is because these scenes that you see there are rather complex, right? And so it seems like a visual explanation is maybe not enough. So we thought, okay, cool. We saw that there are neural symbolic approaches like the one by Josh Tenenbaum and um, his group. Um, so we applied these neural symbolic concept learners and we thought, okay, now, now it's nice because uh, maybe it talks about objects and maybe it, do, uh, it does not have clever hands moments, but unfortunately, no, you just increase the capacity of the model. And so it's much easier even uh, to fool it in a sense. I mean, it's a kind of self-fooling mechanism. So what we then were doing um, is trying to understand whether we can also get a differentiable loss um, that is taking explanations into account. And we came up with a very simple kind of deep network that is also doing a bit of a reasoning, at least in terms of a concept learner, by first taking slot attention and then feeding that into the set transformer in order to reason also about this rather tabular representation. Now, uh, you could, of course, use also a more advanced one. And for example, Hikaru was presenting a triple AI, a differentiable um, forward chaining inference algorithm that I think is also interesting for the database world, but that's a different story. I, I just want to highlight we were focusing on a simple setup here to really not add too much capacity again. Now, you can use, of course, this more complex model and differentiable model also to provide feedback both on the visual modality as well as on the tabular modality here. So essentially you have now two loss terms that are talking about your um, explanation and essentially you're masking the stuff that the gradient should not consider. So essentially you're saying, don't use that part, don't use that part in the image, don't use that part uh, in the table. But because you have a symbolic representation, you can actually give now feedback that is generalizing across different images. So you could really write down even something like, please never make use of a gray box to justify your decision. So it's interesting because we can talk about feedback implicit, we can provide um, implicit feedback that was not present in a sense in the example, and you can just provide general feedback. And then all of a sudden, um, because that also has impact, of course, on the visual part, on the slot attention module, you really get uh, finally the explanations that you would like to have also in the visual um, <clears throat> um, modality. So what we are currently working on is pushing that forward, what is called the Bongertz problem. So these were problems developed originally to argue that neural networks were not really 
good for solving problems that humans can do in a sense. So this is back in the 70s. And we think we can now revisit by at least uh, differentiable representation, which include both uh, the, the vision module as well as a re uh, reasoning module. I'm not going into details here, but it seems to work very initial results. It's quite interesting that you can just use both and they somehow support each other. So overall, I would argue there's still a lot to be done um, and I hope you have seen it. So even if you make them more expressive, of course, Clever Hunt's moments are there, but it's also nice because we can provide feedback now on the semantic level and their symbols really help because we can communicate and I would love to have a formal language there. But of course you can imagine now also to replace by some transformer or some deep NLP model to also do the communication with the user. But I think we are not done for other reasons. So let's revisit what is happening here and imagine that I'm showing you the same image, but I'm asking you now, what is behind the red object if I rotate the scene by 90 degrees, whatever exactly it now means to rotate by 90 degrees. Or again, thank you to Bernhard, you know, remember his example. And we start with his first image and we ask, is there a viewpoint so that I see a chair here? Right, so it seems like we have to understand even when working with images with uh, three-dimensional representations. And I think that's not really easy to do. So we got inspired by neural radiance functions and we were wondering whether we can have an object-based neural radiance function approach here as well. So instead of going for the nerve directly and also instead of now trying to put in extra knowledge in there by for example, looking at a view encoder here or even a variational autocoder here, we were trying to place again slot attention in there and then per slot get a nerve. So essentially we are trying to estimate a set of nerves where each nerve is encoding one object. And if you manage that, then you get both an object-based three-dimensional representation. And of course you can rotate and take any perspective uh, of the scene if you can do that. And so, we managed, I'm not going into details, but it's interesting on the way you can also understand that some parts in the nerve are actually a probabilistic um, model. So in particular, if you walk along this ray trace and try, uh, along the ray and try to understand uh, whether something should be rendered or not, you can make a link to Poisson processes. And this is giving us uh, the tool to actually talk about sets of these models. So we are talking now about a set of for now independent Poisson processes that are giving rise to whether you should get a color there or not in the ray tracing. And I think it's also very interesting to go, go over there into correlated pros, uh, Poisson processes, for example, making use of Poisson sum product networks, but let's see. But the game we are playing here for now is maybe, okay, we don't get a high visual fidelity, but we get a more use, uh, usable representation for reasoning. And I think this is very much interesting because uh, overall we are still not there, right? I mean, all, all our models that we see so far, impressive progress, but common sense, we are not really there yet. And that's what we need in order to tackle something like the third wave of AI, right? Ultimately, I think we all want to have AI systems that can acquire human-like communication and reasoning capabilities with the ability to rec recognize new situations and adapt to them. And for that, at least object-based representation seems very interesting. Whether then the reasoning is implemented in neural fashion or not, I'm agnostic to that. I just want to solve these very challenging and interesting problems. Thanks. Thank you, Christian, for this nice presentation, the last one in our workshop. Do we have questions? I would have one maybe to your very last slide. You're arguing that machines do not have common sense yet. How, how would you define common sense? Yeah, that's why I like this idea yesterday that we talked about, right? It's not just world knowledge to put in there and then you can start reasoning. And to be honest, I don't think it's just reasoning. It's really this question of what is intuition in the end? And can we can we define math mathematical term, what is intuition? Uh, and maybe intuition is something like, looks like reasoning, but we don't know. And it's the black box of Daniel Kremers and I can't open it, but it's a wonderful answer you're giving to me. So I'm not claiming that reasoning is the answer to common sense, but I like the idea that uh, we need actually something like a set of models 
that are maybe on the fly compiled to give you an answer. And this compilation should involve some formal reasoning or aspects at least of that. But to be honest, I'm also very much with Josh, Josh Tenenbaum, saying maybe, maybe we can't really get logical reasoning all the time right, because they are time constraints, right? And keeping, keeping it simple is maybe the trick in order to survive in a complex model uh, world, sorry. So, but I would argue our, our, our vision is that we need something like systems AI, a bit like um, systems biology, and we have to understand how to safely combine different AI models. So it's a bit like what Volker Markel was talking about, now combined with different deep learners, uh, also planners, uh, logical reasoning. And we are just wondering, can we provide the foundations for that? So it's safe to combine them and you don't have to wonder about differentiability and whatever. But yeah, you see, I have no clue answer. It's just a vision. <laughs> Do we have other comments, feedback? Maybe also questions. I don't know if, if Bernard or Jean are still in the call, if we have questions to, to either of these. Um, I would have a question. I don't know, Bernard, are you still listening in? Because Bernard has a <laughs> commitment. Uh, maybe maybe he's he's busy. Um, but I Bernard, think... Bernard just put something into the chat. Um, so yeah, I know he has another commitment, so he may not be available. Um, let's let's close this session and uh, thanks everyone for uh, for attending for joining. Uh, this is now the the, the the end of the the public stream. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks to all the speakers for their great presentations and uh, the lively discussions. I think it was a great success in my view. I've really enjoyed this workshop. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for um, to the organizers. Yes, thanks for the organizers is that is the organizers, but uh, Daniel did all the work because I'm in New York and with the time difference, so he did all the work, so thank him. <laughs> I think he did a great job, so. Thank you. Thank you, Jean.